That's, uh, oh. that's, that's a lot. <laughs> I think I have, a, I'm holding a record for having uh, global star parties in one year. It's been almost, when was it you started the PR. star parties? Was it in June? <laughs> um, August. Not, oh, August, yeah, because we started the Open Go To uh, program in June, I think. Yeah. And that's uh, over 150 now. That's like 160 almost now. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, well, we've put, we've done <clears throat> hundreds of programs. Probably a couple thousand hours of programming online. A lot of information, you yeah. know. I mean, just uh, and and you know, with astronomers from all over the world and and uh, different age groups and you know different kind of missions that we've done, you know, with uh, like the Great Conjunction and the latest was the uh, lunar eclipse. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I guess it would be hundreds of hours of program, not thousands. <laughs> We're not quite there yet. <laughs> That'd be a full time two thousand hours would be full time job, you know. We haven't had that quite that many hours of not that many that's hundreds hundreds of hours though. hundreds of hours oh yeah yeah it's true that is true and millions of of viewers yep i would say yeah here we go And the first one to log in here in chat is Richard Lighthill from Sierra Vista, Arizona. Is that a friend of yours, David? Must be. Sierra Vista, as I recall, is south of Karchner Caverns State Park. You're, you're muted, David. <laughs> David's, David's muted. Here we go. Ask to unmute. There he is. I was saying that if you draw a line between um, between uh, Sierra Vista and our home, Karshner Caverns pretty much bisects it. That's true. So here we go. Richard says he's a friend of Mike Wiesner. Mike Wiesner has lots of friends, but I, uh, you know, your name is definitely someone that I, I know. You're on my radar, Richard. We might have met. It's a possibility. Mike Wiesner says hello from Oracle, Arizona. Your friend Richard Lighthill's on, Mike.
Hello Richard to says, Mike Wiesner. Yeah, Richard says they're building a new observatory out there. Mike Wiesner, the famous astro autobiographer. Yes. That's right. <clears throat> Sharing to the Atlanta Astronomy Club now. We already shared it to like the Facebook Astronomy Club and Telescope Addicts. We still have a very serious group here. I mean, I, I know. can threaten to tell a joke, but then <laughs> you might just go over everyone. And everyone nobody's smiling. They're all like getting psyched up to, you know, be live and do their thing, you know? So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I don't know if you... If uh, Scott is saying to you, David, David, about, but we try to break up and, and cut up a little bit before we do our broadcasts on, uh, at least oh, when man. I get on with Tyler and Scott, we, we start talking oh, about yeah. some interesting things Oh yeah, and start laughing about stuff. Some of it's kind of out there. <laughs> say that right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, the truth is out there, right? Well, that's what they say. <laughs> that's right. If you lie in space, can anyone hear you? Probably not. So is it a lie? <laughs> Probably not. That's right. Well, in space, nobody can hear you scream, so. Oh, I see. Unless you have a microphone and a link to a satellite. Hello, Kareem again. Good to see you. Kareem. Hi, everyone. Good to see everyone. Hey, Dipti. Good hey, to Jerry. see you. Hey, hey, how are you? Hi, hey, John. Did so you guys like Scott. your announcement posters today? They came a little bit late. Fantastic. Good. I'm going to have to start placing a value on certain posters, you know, so that, you know, they go up at like digital currency. You'll buy them with, uh, you'll trade them in Bitcoin. Hey, there's they are uh, collectors' items. Right. Somebody told me they are collecting them. Our yeah. local center was looking at uh, taking the uh, GSP forty five ones and making a set of playing cards out of it. <laughs> that'd be so cool. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. Totally cool. Yeah. Yes. But David would get us with his poker face. He'd take all of our money. <laughs> mm hmm. No, he would not. <laughs> but I, I, I would, I would certainly say that of all the astronomy clubs I'm involved with, Kareem, yours is my favorite. Thank you, David. Yeah, it's great. Of course, he says that to all the astronomy clubs. Which is the way it should be. It was the first one I was ever involved in. I just happened to be here today, so. <laughs> <laughs> No, David and I were both no, just at the it, Montreal Clubhouse. RASC has a, uh, Montreal Center has a special place in David's heart. Oh, definitely. He has a special place for us. He just yeah. opened up our clubhouse tonight and was there for part of my presentation. And now we're showing a, an Eclipse documentary at the moment at the clubhouse. Are you? Very cool. Very Trying cool. to get ready for tomorrow morning. You know, uh, astronomers are slowly starting to gear up to travel, go to some star parties and stuff. The uh, Nebraska star party is going is going to kick off here uh, this year. That will happen in August. Uh, so it's been real interesting talking to John Johnson about that, you know, how they're, they plan to uh, do this uh, safely. Uh, but he said that the group is actually starting to grow quite a bit and they may have to cut it off. I'm not sure if they can cut it off. 
Well, I know uh, Stellafane is uh, shrinking their participation numbers this year uh, a little bit just to just to play it safe. Yeah, but by August things may be in a good state and they may re they may reopen. Yep. Others of us are still stuck, not doing, not being able to go in person with any of our activities or events yet. Yeah, we can't even do club outings because we're limited to maximum eight people from two households for social gatherings still. Still. Yeah. Canada has taken the social distancing very seriously, uh, probably to their benefit, you know. But it's been, uh, I think it's been tough um, psychologically for a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, especially for students, uh, the online learning has been difficult for a lot of them. Right. Deeply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How's it been for yes. you as an educator? Very tough. There's no longer an end of the day, let alone an end of the week. It, uh, it just keeps going. Yeah. And trying to turn everything into digital and be able to maintain the standards of teaching that we try for, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. we got some more people chatting, uh, chiming in here. So we had a little bit of conversation from Richard Lighthill and Mike Wiesner checking in. We have Stephen Hauser. He says, hello from Cl cloudy Idaho. Uh, we've got Harold Locke. Good evening. Great folks from uh, Stargazers all. Andrew Corkill from uh, Southern California. Uh, Jeff Wise. I, I have forgotten where Jeff Wise lives. He says, hello, astronomers and wannabes. Everybody wants it to be. Uh, Norm Hughes is on. And um, let's see, Brian Fanning. Hello there from New Jersey. Uh, we got Juan Pablo Carrillo uh, from Chile. It says, saludos desde Chile. And um, Jeff Wise, he says, from Northern California. So it's just the beginning and we have uh, people, you know, the fun part, I mean, it's a global star party, right? So we have astronomers and participants uh, from all over the world. Now, you guys listening out there in the audience, we do have the after party. If you look at the, at the text that I posted with um, the schedule that you see online, you will see a link to a Zoom waiting room starting at about 10 p.m., a couple hours from now. We'll open it up for the after party for those of you who would like to share something, share an image through your scope or talk about an astronomy experience if you want. And, uh, you know, that's what it's all about. So don't be shy. I, I would make a comment about a wannabe astronomer. You know, you're an astronomer as soon as you go out and look at your first celestial object and understand what it is. And in my, my opinion, that's that's kind of what, you, and then and then you go down I the agree path. With him. I subscribe to that opinion. So, that's so has all anybody? It takes. Uh, sorry, I was wondering if anybody's uh, touched on the idea that uh, the next global star party is number fifty. Yes, we were talking about that. We're gonna have to Excellent. make it special. So I'll be. Um, I'll be interacting with you guys uh, to see what you want to do uh, that you think might make uh, the big five O special. So well, I know they're I trying know to wear black armbands or something, or there will be Justin Trudeau and there will be uh, Joe <laughs> Biden and Kamala Harris. Okay. All right. I didn't know you did impressions, David. That's awesome. <laughs> No, I was thinking they're uh, they're planning on doing that uh, Guinness World Record over in England, where they're going to try to do 140 straight hours of astronomy teaching, uh, oh, astronomy man. outreach, oh. and uh, maybe we can beat them for the Global Star Party 50. You know, just David can tell us poetry for a good uh, 150 hours, right? We'll go through the bookshelf challenge, <laughs> start to end. Yeah, maybe we go for a marathon where it goes from. 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. That would be kind of crazy. Would be. I think all we have to do is stretcher. identify 150 <laughs> objects and talk about each one of them for an hour. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And each one of us has 10 minutes to talk about that object during that hour. Mm hmm. Right. <laughs> well, it works. You can sleep for 50 minutes, wake up and do the next 10. Oh, yeah. It's so easy to sleep for just 15 minutes and then no, wake it's up. It's admirable, this idea of doing 150 for one person. I'm really looking forward to the attempt. Yeah. <laughs> To observe with Hubble, we actually have to plan out pretty far in advance. And for the other planets, what we do is we pick the time when they're at opposition. And that means that it's opposite from the sun, from the Earth's point of view. And that basically gives us the highest resolution view. That's when Hubble is the closest to each planet, even though that doesn't vary much over a year. And the planets are a little bit more challenging because they move. And so Hubble has to find guide stars first that tell it where it's pointing in the sky, but then it has to track those planets. So it has to move following the planet across the sky. And so that has to be interleaved with all the other science program Hubble's doing every single day. And so it's very carefully coordinated to fit in as Hubble then orbits around the Earth. And so it gets planned out down to the minute of exactly which image we're going to take in which filter for each of those planets. So it's a cosmic dance of getting Hubble pointed in the right place, moving in the right direction, and tracking all at the same time. Every time I see the Opal Project or the Outer Planets Atmosphere, things that the Hubble Space Telescope has done, I just think of what an incredible world contribution that has been. And what we're doing is we're looking at each of the outer planets every year so that we can build up a time base using the exact same facility and the same instruments so we can actually track what's changing over the years on each of those planets. It started really with Jupiter. In essence, we were trying to look at the weather on Jupiter. And as we're trying to understand weather, we know even here on Earth, it changes every minute, every hour, every day. And we didn't have that kind of time coverage, but we also didn't even have long time coverage to look at things that changed over seasons. And so we had this big gap in our knowledge where we just weren't getting frequent enough data to be able to trend any of these things. And the idea kind of came about to look at a legacy program where we built up a legacy for Hubble within the planetary community. And in 2014, we started with our first observations of Uranus. And the first thing I think we noticed was Uranus had a very prominent polar cap. It was very much brighter and getting brighter over time. We've watched it over the last few years get much brighter. Neptune, on the other hand, has been really quite interesting. The first thing we noted was it had a lot of bright white clouds and they were coming and going pretty rapidly at a lot of different latitudes. And so when we start looking at Neptune and Uranus as dynamic planets with changing atmospheres, weather, like we know now for Jupiter and Saturn, um, we realize that we have a lot of gaps in our understanding. And so we've been able to use the OPAL program to track how much cloud cover we have from year to year. But the other thing we can do with Hubble that we can't really do any other way is look for dark spots. And so the great dark spot was this big iconic feature we saw with Voyager. And when we looked again a few years later, finally when Hubble was online, it was gone. And that kind of surprised us because we were used to the great red spot, which doesn't go away. It's changed over time, but it's still there. And so these storms are not quite the same as what we see on Jupiter because they form and go away on much more rapid timescales. The latest image of Neptune is really interesting to me because we don't see those bright white clouds we've been seeing the last few years. As a matter of fact, the only thing we see in that particular image is this great dark spot. And so in a lot of ways, it brings us around full circle because this looks so much like the Voyager image from 1989. And that was pretty surprising to me, not to see as much cloud activity as we've been seeing in previous years. The Opal team is actually a fairly small team. There's only three of us, but our data is immediately available to the public and any other scientist that wants to use them. And so we do that as well as our own scientific analysis. I think having so much Hubble data now, there's just so much in there to study. And, you know, as a scientist, that's what drives us is trying to solve mysteries, trying to look for new mysteries. And so having these long-term data sets with just such rich numbers of features in there, there's always something to go look at. And it's certainly gonna keep us busy for years to come, even when we're not getting any more data.
Well, hello everyone. This is Scott Roberts and with me are several of the people that will be coming on to our program today. Um, it's an exciting uh, star party, the 49th Global Star Party. Uh, and uh, the basic overall theme was, uh, you know, stars and their worlds, but uh, you know, that could take us anywhere in the universe. Um, what I'm, I'm uh, the schedule is uh, uh, starting out uh, in our first segment with uh, the Astronomical League. Um, we'll have uh, John Goss on who will be uh, talking about um, uh, questions and answers where uh, participants uh, could win prizes, valuable prizes from our prize partners and from Explore Scientific. Um, and uh, we have uh, uh, three young women uh, on our program uh, that will be talking about their passion for space exploration and astronomy. Uh, that would include uh, uh, Libby and the Stars. We have uh, DT Gautam uh, from Nepal and uh, Sabella uh, Burlingame, uh, who is uh, uh, on for her first time. Uh, both Libby and Sabella are 11 years old and I think they're both going to space camp again this year, so it's going to be pretty exciting for them. Um, Kareem Jaffer is uh, a professor uh, joining us from Canada in the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's uh, Montreal Center. So it's very cool to have him back on. Uh, you know, and um, Jerry Hubble uh, from the Mark Slade Remote Observatory and Explore Scientific. So. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, David Levy. Uh, David is, um, uh, you know, our our guiding light here at the Global Star Party. Uh, he has, uh, uh, you know, I, I marvel at all of the events that he's done. You know, the guy <clears throat> has done marathon uh, events, star parties, lectures. Uh, you know, he continues to write great books on, that inspire people around the world. Uh, we're so fortunate to have him on Global Star Party, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to have him as my dear friend. And uh, David, thanks again for coming on to the 49th Global Star Party. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Scott. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here one day after your birthday. So on behalf of everyone on Zoom, on Facebook, YouTube, and everybody else, we wish you the happiest of birthdays. Oh, thank you, thank you. This this year, um, uh, we I I you know Facebook allows you to celebrate your birthday by having people donate to a worthy cause. And so this year, I picked Mount Wilson Observatory, and we set a thousand dollar goal, and we met that thousand dollars. I think sometime this morning. So that was pretty cool. So well, what but, a special uh, birthday present for you. Yeah, yeah. So it's great. It was great. Well, Scotty asked me each time to come up with an appropriate poem. And I think there is very little that's more appropriate uh, right now than to celebrate tomorrow's eclipse of the sun. We're not going to see it here in Arizona, but Kareem, who will be on later tonight, is going to get to see it from Montreal. All right. And I think that's really lucky and I can't wait to hear his report as to what he saw. <clears throat> nice deep partial eclipse. If you can get far enough north, it'll actually be annular. But um, we'll see what we'll see what happens. For my quotation in honor of the star party tonight, we're going to go to William Shakespeare and King Lear. And uh, we go to Gloucester, and Gloucester was one of the earls who was visiting King Lear when that play opens, and he witnessed Lear's total loss of temper and his loss of rationality, as he talks about. And then afterwards, Gloucester goes back to his castle, and he's getting very upset about it, doesn't know what to do, and he starts pacing, going back and forth, and finally he works himself almost into a panic. And he says, these late eclipses and the sun and moon pretend no good to us. Though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus, yet nature finds itself scourged by the sequent effects. Love cools, friendship falls off, brothers divide. 
meantime, his illegitimate son, Edmund, jumps uh, out of the shadows and he says to his dad, this is the excellent foppery of the world that when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeits of our own behavior, we make guilty of our disasters, the sun, the moon and stars, as if we were villains on necessity. Anyway, in these days, hundreds of years after Shakespeare, I like to imagine Shakespeare coming to our global star party and saying, you know what? I really don't want to hear about King Lear tonight. I want to see the eclipse tomorrow morning. So I'm going to join the Montreal group and I hope we'll be able to see the eclipse together. And on that note, I hand it back to you, Scotty. Oh, thanks very much, David. David, uh, uh, we have um, coming up next is John Goss from the Astronomical League. But I was, uh, you know, what do you think about having so many young people on the Global Star Party? Oh, I think it's a great idea. Uh, we've had Libby for a long, long time. Yes. PT. Yeah. And then to have Sibella added to the uh, thing, I think. This will be a revolution of the young. We're going to take over astronomy. Yeah, the, I've heard that. The young will take over the world. So, you know. And um, uh, when we want to take over, when we want to use the Hubble Space Telescope, we will have to ask Sibella, Libby, and Deep Team if we can use it. For permission. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So when you're doing the next servicing mission on Hubble, don't forget your friends, okay? So... <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, I'm, next up is uh, John Goss from the Astronomical League. Uh, we are um, actually this Friday, we will be doing another Astronomical League live program where uh, the officers of the Astronomical League come on and bring on special guests, special speakers, uh, and they give an amazing program. Uh, very educational, very, you know, lots of great information coming from the Astronomical League and all the benefits that they offer uh, to clubs around the world uh, and members around the world. Uh, the Astronomical League is the largest, I think they're the largest federation of astronomy clubs on the planet. I, I'm not sure of that, but I believe they are. Um, uh, John could confirm that. Uh, and I think you guys have about 20,000 members, something like that. So it's uh, a, a huge force and um, and all a force for good, you know? So um, John, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sure, uh, th thank you, Scott. Yeah, we have uh, just under 19,000 actually, but I'll, I'll take- I'll take, I'll take the, the extra thousand. I'll take, okay. I'll take, yeah. And, um, and something I, I, I did want to mention to all these young people out there. Now, unfortunately, when we talk about young people, we mean people less than 40 years old. So uh, it's you know, true. <laughs> it's true. Yes. I, 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 think, I think amateur astronomy has, uh, in, in, in the public's eye, has a rather what I call a high coolness quotient. Yeah, you know, you, you, you talk about astronomy uh, to, to anybody in the public and either, well, they either have no idea what you're talking about or they're going to be thinking, yeah, that is really, really, really something there. So it's, uh, you know, I just want to encourage you all to, to stay in it, uh, be active in it, because it, it's a, it, for a guy my age, I, th I still think it's pretty cool. But anyway, yeah. I'd like to uh, say a few things or show you a few things here. Mm -hmm. Maybe. One moment. Okay. Good. Um, yes, the Astronomical League, uh, as, as Scott was saying, that we, we've been around for a while. We have quite a few people. We're probably, as I was just saying, we're, we're just under 19,000 right now, and this is our 75th year since we were founded in, on um, November 15th, 1946. Uh, almost every year, we have had a national convention. Uh, for the past more than 50 years, we've had one every year, except for last year. And of course, the reason for that's pretty obvious. But um, this year, we're going ahead with a, a, a virtual convention. You know, it, it's kind of funny right, right now, right now, the way things are going, more things are opening and and uh, starting up uh, back to normal, more or less. 
Well, the convention itself is in August and I, my own personal opinion that in August things will be pretty much back to normal, but because of planning um, restrictions, we've had to do this uh, virtually this year. Next year, we will be back in person. But anyway, uh, Alcon uh, 2021 will be held in August, uh, August 19th to the 21st. Our, our keynote speaker is Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who if, um, for those of you who know a little bit about the recent history of astronomy, she is a, she plays a, she's, she's a big name. And talking about pulsars and, and all the, all that stuff. Uh, she is uh, very, very much well into all that. So it, it's good to have her as, as, as a speaker. Uh, before we actually go into our questions, we always like to remind people, especially, especially tonight, since tomorrow we have the eclipse, to, right. be, to practice complete safety when, when, when looking at the sun. Um, uh, amateur astronomers pretty much know how to do this, but we got to make sure that they use the right um, filters and such. And so we have a list of things here, which I'm sure most, most of you have, have, have heard about. But one thing we added at the bottom says always keep the cap on, on your finder scope because the, your finder scope is probably like a two inch uh, diameter and that can uh, oh, yeah. quite a few, quite a bit of light through. So always keep, keep, keep that closed. Uh, last week, last our party, we asked three questions and we're gonna go over them right now Supply the answers. Uh, number question number one: On what day of the week is the next total solar eclipse over the USA? Now, this is the total solar eclipse, not 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 your annual or for tomorrow. Well, it's uh, just less than uh, 34, 34 months, so it's on Monday, April eighth, two thousand twenty-four. Which I'll I'll say, I'll say this: that is the date of my wedding anniversary. Wow! And the center line goes over the church we were married in. What? So, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. That is, now, that is complete coincidence. We did not schedule it like that. That's how it worked out. So we'll see what happens in, in uh, 34 months from now. <laughs> right. Okay, second question. In what constellation will you find this object? Now, this is a really, if, if you're just going into amateur astronomy, this is a great object to try because it's a great binocular object and it's fairly easy to find in the summer Milky Way. Uh, the constellation is called uh, Volpecula. And I think most amateurs call this the coat, the coat hanger cluster. It resembles upside down coat hanger or less. It does. I think that, that it's, it's really, really attractive. Yeah, it does. You know, turn, turn your head upside down or I'll turn the screen upside down. No, we'll just go with that. <laughs> question. Question well, it looks three. like one of the coat hangers in my closet where one of them has fallen down. So. Yeah, yeah, there, there, you, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if, they, I guess they still make coat, coat, coat hairs like that. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, number three, name the three brightest stars that make up the summer triangle, which is very fitting because now the summer triangle is rising in the east and in northeast uh, right after sunset. So the brightest star is, is Vega and it's in Lyra. Uh, the next brightest star is Altair, which is an Aquila. And then the, the dimmest of the three is Deneb, which is a Cygnus. And Deneb's still pretty easy to see. Uh, so that's always a great uh, uh, sky mark to find your way around the night sky. Now the answers uh, from the last star party, uh, the, um, we had uh, five people here and th their names will be added to the big door prize list, which our Terry Mann, uh, our treasurer will be, excuse me, our secretary will be talking about next time. Uh, Andrew Corkill, Cameron Gillis, Jeff Weiss, uh, Neil Cox, and Pekla Hatala. Um, congratulations. Yeah, wow. Okay, now, drum roll blah, 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 for this week. Oh, for this week, we do have three questions. Uh, send your answers. Don't send them to me. Don't send them to Scott. Send Don't them put them in chat. Yeah, don't do any of that. Just send them to secretary at astroleague.org. And uh, we will have a drawing for those names too. Okay, question number one. If Earth were reduced to the size of a common globe, you know, just like you have at home, found in many homes and schools, what would be the relative size of the moon and what would be its distance from Earth on this scale? Okay, uh, number, uh, excuse me, number letter A, the moon would be the size of a marble placed one foot away from the earth size, excuse me, from the globe sized earth. B, 
the moon would be another nine inch globe placed about three feet from their earth globe or C, the moon would be the size of a tennis ball placed about 20 feet away. So it's like on the other side of the room for most rooms. So write down the answers for that. Number two, question two. Now this is topical because of tomorrow morning, we're gonna yeah. have uh, an eclipse of the sun. Uh, so um, the moon reaches its new phase when it moves between the earth and the sun, such as tomorrow morning. The Astronomical League's Lunar Observing Program requires the observer to spot the young moon's thin crescent. What is the oldest moon? <laughs> This is kind of complicated. What is the oldest moon expressed in hours that is allowed to fulfill the requirement of viewing a young moon? In other words, this would be the number of hours since the new phase. So this would be the number of hours since the moon uh, was went, went through, or excuse me, since the moon, since the sun went through the solar eclipse tomorrow morning. A, would it be 12 hours later? B, 24 hours later? C, 48 hours later? This is the Astronomical League's Lunar Observing Program we're referring to. Hmm. Hmm. That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. But number three, I don't know if that's so tough. Question three, how many Earth-sized worlds, when mashed together, you know, just scrunched, shoved inside a, uh, a ball, the volume of Jupiter, how many could fit inside Jupiter? Huh. A. Yeah, A would be zero. Earth could not, uh, could not fit inside Jupiter. So in other words, this is a trick question. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. We don't do trick questions. <laughs> B, B would be 10 Earths if when smashed together could fit inside a, a Jupiter volume. Or C, uh, up to 1,000 Earths could be smashed inside of a Jupiter volume. So again... Um, so this is the volume. This is not the diameter, right? This is the volume. It's like... You, okay. you a huge beach ball, how many small little balls could you shove inside of it and smash inside as much right. as you can? Yeah. Okay. Jupiter's a big planet. It is. It's the biggest in our solar system. Okay. So uh, one last plug for Friday night, I believe. Uh, Astronomical League Live it will be our seventh event, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, we'll be uh, featuring Haley Wall. Uh, uh, along with other members of the Astronomical League talking uh, more about Alcon, describing a little bit to you a little more about what's going to happen. And about other league things and other events happen in the world of amateur astronomy. One more thing I'll just, I'll just say right, right, right now. I thought, I thought that the pictures that NASA released yesterday uh, of Ganymede, they, they were fantastic. They were fantastic. So there's always something interesting going on in amateur astronomy. Yep, that's true. So on that, I will stop my share, come back to the real world. And thank you, Scott, for letting me uh, on for a few minutes. And thank you all for listening uh, to the questions and about the Astronomical League. That's thank great. You. That's great. And um, if you guys have not uh, considered joining the Astronomical League, uh, check your club to make sure that they are involved with the league. Uh, you may already be a member. You may not even know it. But uh, um, otherwise, uh, they have a member at large program so that you can join from anywhere in the world. Um, and uh, you will find the benefits to be amazing. So. Well, thank you very much, John. Believe it or not, believe it or not, you can be a member of the league for as little as five dollars. Wow! So I'll leave it at that, and you can figure out what I'm talking about. Yeah, that is, yeah. So I'm putting up their website right now, and uh, that's great. Thank you very much, John. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. All right. So up next is. Uh, uh, Libby in the stars. She uh, has for a long time giving us uh, amazing lectures covering everything from the planets to nebula, galaxies, stars, uh, you know, uh, the idea of uh, space exploration. Uh, and um, uh, tonight her presentation is going to be on the constellation Cygnus. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Libby. Thank you for all the presentations you've given us. It's been great. Thank you. Um, it's been very fun coming on here. I very much enjoy it. I'm going to share my slide now. 
And here, just a second. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the constellation Cygnus. And um, first I'll just talk about a little bit about the constellation. And um, the constellation Cygnus is actually the 18th largest constellation in our sky. It means swan in Greek. And it, um, it also has a star Deneb in it. That's how I pronounce it. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it because I know a lot of the space terms are pronounced differently. Um, and it's also very close to the star Vega. Vega is not part of the Cygnus constellation, but it is very close to it and, it went, and is located a little bit more north of it. Cygnus in our sky is um, just on the plane of the Milky Way. So when you look at the Milky Way, it'll just be right along the trail of all these stars. You'll see it across there. Um, it is in, you can see it in the northern summer and springtime. It is best visible at 9 p.m. during the month of September. And what is inside Cygnus? The stars, the stars Albireo, that's how I pronounce it. <laughs> and a bunch <laughs> of this stuff is a lot harder to pronounce because of the Greek's Al name. Albireo is how a lot of us pronounce it. But you know what? You may be right. There's could be a lot of different ways to pronounce these stars' names. Yeah, I know, I know uh, all the Greeks, they named it. So um, I know a lot of it is pronounced differently. I've heard so many mm -hmm. people um charles messier his last name some people will say messier and some people will say messier yep. out of the french um the um this um inside the constellation cygnus the firework galaxy north american nebula the vel nebula and the sadar region it um that is all that it holds in it, which is a lot. Um, there, there's clearly a lot of nebula stars and galaxies in this constellation, which makes it the 16th largest constellation in our sky and 804 square degrees in our sky. Mm -hmm. And um, the jewel bag nebula. Oh, I just realized I missed a full stinking line of nebula when I was reading it. Um, so the jewel bag nebula, the pelican, the pelican nebula, crescent nebula, fireworks nebula, North American nebula, Vel nebula, and the Saturn region. Um, I looked at it wrong for a second, and I didn't realize I had a line of more nebulas that were in it, which makes it the 16th largest constellation in our sky. So if you want to view the constellation Cygnus, you should definitely view it at the time of 9 p.m. in September. And so I know most of us have seen, um, I know I have been able, I've heard a, a lot about the Crescent Nebula. I know most of the astronomers here have seen that before. And con the constellation Cygnus, I think is a very important. Um, it's in the line of the Milky Way, the plane. So when you're looking into the sky, you'll just see a line of stars and that's kind of the Milky Way line, the plane which mm -hmm. people call it because it's kind of all these stars are grouped together there. Um, where I live because of the light pollution so bad, I can't really see too much of the belt um, in the plane of the Milky Way across the sky. I can see a couple of more brighter stars, but I know um, I recently just got back from Key West. Um, I went, I can't, I got back, I have to say June, first I have to say and um we just got back me and my mom drove there and um we drove to Key West from our house and um I have to say uh we went to Key West for the day and when we were coming back at night it was beautiful out because um there's mm -hmm. not a lot of light pollution out there because it's a lot of out sea and I remember I was in the car and I was just looking out the window and there's just like a plane of all these Milky Way stars and they're all just so beautiful. Cause I've, I've always heard about, I've seen the Milky Way plane once when I went to Mount Magazine and um, and then I get to see it again, it's just breathtaking. I'm like, you've every single time you look at it, you even forget 
that you're even that you've seen it before because you're just like wow this is so beautiful and um the stargazing is amazing out there um it was beautiful and um it definitely looked very pretty out in Key West and I'm glad I'm back I get to do the star parties back again and I get to share what it, the stargazing was like in Key West I hope everybody here gets to experience that yeah you know what's down there Libby is the winter star party it's about it's in between Marathon and Key West so you guys would have had to drive through all of that and um it does have a beautiful uh, they have a beautiful site where it is very dark out there and um it will it, they will have it again in february of next year so maybe maybe you and your family are there that would be great to have you uh at at the event and you could see one of your you know what a big star party is like down there yes um i do, i like being on the road um we drove all the way from northwest arkansas to now all we went to um disney for my brother's birthday and we celebrated for his 21st birthday so he definitely partied for that and then we um went down to key largo and it was a lot of fun down there we only um we only got to stay for two days down there because one mm -hmm. day we spent driving down and then the other day we spent just around key west and it's beautiful down there that's great. I'm glad you experienced that. Wonderful. I like being on the road. I like driving. So I like the open road. So I'm not <laughs> to drive anywhere. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm sure you have many uh, road trips, you know, wonderful road trips ahead of you. That's great. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, okay. It's almost the 50th star party. That's right. That's uh -huh. right. Yeah, so you'll have to bring your game on, Libby. Yeah. Number 5 -0. I'm going to, instead of a 10-minute talk, it's going to be like two hours. <laughs> we will give you more time. It is. It's a good thing it's summer because if I had school, I'd probably have to skip the next day because I'd be staying up to like 2 a.m. and I wouldn't be able, I only get like two hours of sleep. Yeah. Staying up right. to like four probably. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have lots of energy, though, Libby, and we we we're really uh, pleased and uh, happy that you bring all your energy and passion to the Global Star Party. So thank you. You get these people pumped up. So it's wonderful. Yeah. I'm so excited. There's someone my age on this call now. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's right. So Sabella will be on, and uh, she's got a very nice presentation. I think you'll be impressed. So that's great. But up next is DT, Deepti Gautam uh, from Nepal. And uh, Deepti has also been on our program many times. Uh, she has started to do some poetry. I don't know if she'll have a poem this time, but uh, uh, she is um, she's gifted in that way. And someone's very, very interested in astronomy, very active in astronomy, especially when it comes to young people and women in astronomy in the country of Nepal, where she comes from. So. It's wonderful, uh, Deep T. You're, you've got the uh, stage. Thank you, Scott. And as I've said in my recent poetry, the glory of the star party, our Scott Roberts. And okay, I'm going to start. Um, like I'm talking about the star formation and about the star. So let's start. A uh, star is an astronomical object uh, which contains a luminous uh, sphere of plasma held together by its own gravity and the nearest star to earth is the sun and many other stars are visible to the naked eyes at night but due to their immense distance from earth they appear as fixed point of light in the sky and star any massive uh, self-luminous celestial body of uh, gas that shine by the radiation derived from the internal energy source uh, of the tens of billions of billions of trillions of stars composing the observable universe, only a very, very small percentage are visible to the naked eyes. 
You know, star life begins with the gravitational collapse of gaseous nebula of material composed primarily of hydrogens along with helium and trash among the of among uh, amount of heavier elements and the total mass of a star is the main factor that determines uh, its evolution and even um, uh, eventual fate and for uh, most of its active life uh, star science uh, due to the thermonuclear fusions of hydrogen into helium in its course and uh, releasing energy uh, that traverses the star interior and they radiates into outer uh, space. And at the end of a uh, star's lifetime, its core becomes stellar, a white dwarf or a Newton star, or if it is uh, sufficiently massive, a black hole. And as the cloud collapse, individuals uh, of uh, dense dust and gas um, Yes, uh, form bulk globs, and as a globule uh, collapses and the density increases, the gravitational energy converts into heat and temperature rise. And when the pro uh, protostellar cloud has approximately reached in uh, reached the stable conditions and of hydrostatics equilibrium, a protostar form the core. And this pre-main sequence star are often surrounded by uh, protoplanetary disks and powered mainly by the uh, conversion conversion of gravitational energy. And the period of uh, gravitational constants last about 10 million years uh, for uh, stars like the sun and up to 100 Hundred million year for red dwarf, and um, yeah, um, I have uh, one poem uh, by Sam uh, Willing Worth. We are all made of star. Thirteen point eight billion years ago, the universe exploded into life, cutting through space time like a celestial knife, through butter and bringing with it very prim. Premutation and combination of event that will ever occur. The remnants of the blast forget the heat of the furious past, and the tiny particles come together to form elements of hydrogen and helium. With time, this cloud of dust and gas build bonds that would last, coming together under gravity to form a star which bond with nuclear fire. Their temperature got higher, and in the center of the, this star, in their very core, the hydrogen and helium fuse together to form new elements, lithium, beryllium, and carbon. As their heavier elements were created, the star becomes so massive that they eventually collapse under the weight of their own gravitational narcissism. And another is resulting in explosion of supernova. This supernova scattered the star elements across the universe, where once more they come together under gravity to form a new star and new planets. So our solar system, our sun, and our Earth are all made from the fragment of some ancient star. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Wonderful, DT. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to have those written out so that I can share them. Uh, Really, oh, I, I don't, do, do your poems just like come to you and you just write them down as fast as you can, or does it take a lot of work? No, just um, while involving and sourcing about them, uh, I can create. And recently, I'm writing the story and typical story about our society in, in my native language. Uh, so I'm utilizing my time for writing. And so creating. while you're doing this, you're writing poetry and. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Smart girl. <laughs> Thank you so much, Deep T. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so up next here is uh, Sabella um, Burlingame, and this is her first show on on Global Star Party. And uh, Sabella, how are you doing today? Good. Good. Well, what do you think of Global Star Party so far? I think it's pretty interesting. Like I. I never knew, um, like my dad just, when they brought it up and then I'm like, those things exist? And yeah. then I didn't know it would, what it would be like. And it's so amazing. Like I can, I've learned so much like just from this. Well, our, our program has evolved by the contributions of all the 
people, uh, the astronomers that have come on, people like yourself, Sabella, that uh, decided to come on uh, and, and be part of this program. It's not easy for a lot of people to go on to a program and think that, oh, well, I'm live and I'm on the spot and there's no rehearsal, you know, so, but, um, uh, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, uh, you're 11 years old, right? Yeah. Yep. In fifth grade. Uh, same, I think the same age as Libby. Um, and uh, you are going to space camp uh, this year. Why don't you tell us a little bit about why, you know, why did you get really interested in astronomy and space and all of that? You know, yeah. what would, what what happened? Did, was it your parents? Was it something you found? Um. So actually, when I was a little girl, like a baby, I would like look at the moon like whoa. Um. What? And then like um, I think was it in like 2018, Mars was um really close to the Earth, and Dad bought a telescope just so we can see it. And I'm like whoa. And then he bought <laughs> more telescopes, and then he bought more telescopes. Then in third grade, my science fair came along and um, I did it based on, um, wasn't really a science project, it was just like a demonstration. Mm -hmm. so I had um, like the Lego version of the Saturn V rocket. Um, cool. And I had um, like a presentation about what um, some of the Apollo missions were about. Um, so, and then fourth grade, um, was when I applied for a scholarship for space camp. And then um, a couple months later, I got accepted. Um, right. So, um, and my presentation will be about my, um, that project, so yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, do you think, I mean, since, I mean, it seems like almost like from maybe birth, you were <laughs> kind of, predisposed to being really interested in astronomy and space and all of that, uh, you know, seeing the moon and looking through your dad's telescope. Do you have a telescope of your own now or? Um, yes. Um, I, I, I don't know how many telescopes we have, um, but yeah, I right. have, um, we have a lot. Right. You know, when I talked to Libby about uh, her experience at school and her friends and the environment, you know, kind of her environment and stuff, she has often kind of lamented that, uh, you know, I mean, she's super interested in all things astronomy and space exploration. Uh, but a, a lot of her friends, not so much. Uh, do you run into that yourself or do you find that you have a lot of friends that are also interested? I have like way too many friends that are interested in space, actually. Um, my friend Delaney, she wants to become an astronaut. Um, my cool. friend Van wants to be a scientist. Um, and then um, some of my other friends want to help design rockets for um, uh, NASA and. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's wonderful. You know, so hopefully uh, uh, you and Libby become uh, good friends as, as we go forward here. And I, I hope that you come on our program uh, regularly, if you'd like. Um, so uh, we're, uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, it's a, it's a great uh, opportunity to, uh, you know, hone your presentation style and all of that. But I can tell you're comfortable right now being on, on our program. So that's, I'm glad about that. That's great. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about this video that we're going to show here uh, before I show it. Um, so basically, it's going to be about, um, I have an example here, even though it's not the exact color, when you look through sunglasses, it makes everything distorted. Um, yeah. It kind of glare. Um, but um, when you, like the astronauts uh, helmet visors, they're gold, so they're tinted, so they can't see colors normally. And um, because of the radiation, they have to have this gold visor, and it's made of real that's made of real gold, but they can, it's thin enough so that way they can see through the gold. Um, but some astronauts are taking the risk to lift it up, but they're being exposed to radiation, so it can be very dangerous sometimes. Um, mm. So I wanted to design a way for astronauts um, to see real colors and what's actually happening without, um, without having to lift up their visors and being exposed to radiation. 
to protect their eyes and I guess their skin too. So yeah. very interesting, very interesting. So, okay, well, we're going to show this and then uh, after I'm done with the video, we'll come back to you and we'll wrap it up. Okay. How does that sound? Sounds good. Okay. So here we go. is Sabella Berlingame, and this is my STEM fair project. I've always dreamed of becoming an astronaut someday, so I wanted to do a scientific investigation that was related to this challenging occupation. Earth, when people are outside during daylight hours, their eyes and skin are mostly protected from the sun's radiation by our planet's thick atmosphere. In outer space, however, there is little atmosphere, so the sun's radiation can be very dangerous to space travelers. That is why astronauts need to wear special spacesuits and helmets that has a visor. This visor is tinted with a very thin layer of real gold that blocks the sun's harmful radiation from their eyes. But I learned that this gold color makes everything look yellowish-orange when the astronauts look through their visors, so they don't see the real colors of the objects they were studying. So they sometimes raised their gold visors to see colors better. Unfortunately, that also means their eyes and face are being exposed to dangerous radiation. So I wanted to see if I could do something to prevent that. In my research, I learned that complementary colors are pairs of colors which, when combined or mixed, cancel each other out. A color wheel shows the 12 main colors in wedges that are arranged in a circle like a pie. Each wedge shows the opposite colors directly above or below their position on the wheel. When I looked at the color wheel, I noticed that the opposite or complementary color of gold, or orange-yellow, is a blue-violet, which is also called indigo. I also learned that the color of light coming from the sun on Earth looks different from the color of its light in outer space. On Earth, it looks yellowish-orange due to our atmosphere, while in space, it looks white because there is far less atmosphere. These colors of light can be measured in Kelvin degrees to find out their color temperatures. I learned that the color temperature of the sun on Earth is 5,000 degrees Kelvin, but 5,900 degrees Kelvin in outer space. So to be accurate in my experiment, I wanted to try to duplicate this same color of light found in space to test my hypothesis. Since indigo is the complementary or opposite color of gold, I believe if I add an indigo filter behind a gold one, it will cancel out the gold and make all the colors in space look more normal. I decided my control variables would be the color temperature and brightness of the lights the distance from the lights to the color wheel chart inside the black box, and the camera settings used to take pictures of the results. The changing variable would be the color of the wedges used in the experiment. The responding variable would be the actual colors seen on the color wheel poster located inside the black box. I created my design by following these steps. Step one, create large black box and put color wheel chart inside. Step two, light the color wheel with three ring lights and change the color temperature for the lights until they reach 5,900 degrees Kelvin, 
which is the color temperature of the sun in space. We use one of my dad's professional video cameras to measure the color temperature. Step three, make two identical color wheel discs that I could see through with both eyes while spinning them on the outside of the box. I made these with colored cellophane and some clear DVD spacers that my dad saved from his work. These wedges are the same 12 colors that are on the color wheel inside except for blue-green, which I didn't have room for because the discs were too small. I also wanted to leave one of the wedges clear without any color added so I could see what the colors on the wheel inside looked like without any filters. Because I wanted to see what change these colors would make behind a gold visor, I put gold cellophane behind all of the wedges except the clear one. I slowly turned the colored discs on the front of the black box to see which wedge made the colors inside appear the most normal behind the gold cellophane. I was very happy to find out in this experiment that indigo was by far the best color out of the 11 colors to use behind a gold visor to correct the colors, so my hypothesis was correct. All of the other colors made the colors on the color wheel poster inside the black box look worse, so I hope someday astronauts will have gold visors with indigo in them. Wow, that was uh, that was a great presentation, Sabella. That's great. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about that presentation. And uh, you know, uh, obviously, that was a lot of work to get that all put together. Um, you know, what, where did you get the idea to to do this? Um, so one day after piano lessons, I really um, wanted to go to speech camp, and I was like, Mom, Dad. Please, 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 please. <laughs> and then um, they thought about it and they said yes. Um, and then I, um, I remember that there was a scholarship. And then um, I'm like, maybe I can apply for a scholarship. And yeah. then um, I looked around the car. And, like, hmm. and then uh, our, our friend was like these side pockets, and I pulled a pair of sunglasses out. And I'm like, why can't I see through these normally? Um, <laughs> and I'm like. Then, then I'm like, wait a minute, I think astronauts have the same problem. So, yeah. like, perfect idea. Like, that was the first idea, and I liked it. I thought, 
Perfect. Wonderful. And uh, did it take a long time to put all that together? Or, you know, what, what was kind of the result of this? You showed it to your class, your fifth grade class. Uh, where, was it with other presentations or did you just uh, ask to, um, to make this special presentation? Yeah, so everybody was required to do um, a STEM career project, as we call it. I personally like science career project better. Um, yeah. Um, and um, uh, he asked, like, every, like, at the end of every Friday, he asked everybody how they're doing. I'm like, I was done a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this video took about a week, and the project itself took about four weeks. So yeah, in total, about five weeks. Of oh. Work. Excellent. This is a wonderful job. I, I'm I'm really really impressed. And what was the what was the overall reaction? I mean, uh, I hope you got a A plus for that. So yeah, I haven't gotten my report card yet. Um, okay. but everybody loved it. Um, yeah, <laughs> they were That's like, great. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. I was very happy. Well, congratulations. We got nice. Uh, you know, the, the, our audience really loved it, I know. And um, so we look forward to having you on again, uh, you know, and um, consider yourself a, uh, uh, a VIP of the Global Star Party. Sabella, thank you so much. You are most welcome. Is there anything that you wanted to add before we go to break? I don't think so. You don't think so, okay. All right, well, we're gonna take a 10 minute break and we'll be coming back um, with more of the Global Star Party. So uh, take this time to go get a cup of coffee or a sandwich or something or stretch your legs. We'll see you in a minute, in 10 minutes. So it was a great job, Deep T and Libby and uh, um, Sabella, thank you so much. You know, to have so many young people on all at once like that is really inspiring, you know. So I, I think for a lot of us, we feel like we got started too late, <laughs> you know. So, but it's never too late to get started to uh, explore the night sky and to learn more about science and to do your job in supporting and promoting science uh, for young people like, uh, like DT and Sabella and Libby. So I will be back. Um, I'm going to take stretch my legs for a minute as well. So, in here, but some amazing work by the three young ladies. That was fantastic. It was amazing. <laughs> it was really amazing. I can I can believe it. with those young kids uh, thinking of all of that. They, this practically blew my mind. <laughs> you know, Maxi, I've great like I've judged science fairs and so many of the projects miss out on, you know, context or the design or this was this video she covered everything. <laughs> Sabella, that was fantastic. Every detail. Was, every yeah. single you. detail. <laughs> I, I, I helped judge one of the online science fairs last summer <laughs> during the whole COVID things as it just started and all the science fairs got canceled. And your video would have been up there with some of the some of the top placements that I've seen. That was that was oh, your oh. your design was good, but also just the way you described the motivation and the context behind every single step. It was good. I, I I'm really impressed. She practically did the the scientific. Um, the, I, I don't know how you say it. Um, the the methodology. The method. Yeah. Methodology, exactly, perfectly. <laughs> no, no, uh, the research, the, the experiments, the, the, the data, the conclusion, the theory, everything. No, no, <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm gonna grab a coffee too. I'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, see you later.
serials fun. Oh, the birthday cake, let me check. They left one piece. Maybe I'll eat some of this.
Scott, did you get yourself a tea or coffee? I did get myself a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have some of my birthday cake left here. So I'm having Oh, pizza. very nice. Yeah. What flavor? Mm. It is um, called Tres Leches, you know, three. Oh, yeah. Milk. Yeah. With, with fruit, strawberries, and grapes, and, you know. So it's great. That way you're being nutritious. It's balanced. <laughs> yeah, and when you come up to with uh, caffeinated uh, coffee and and uh, yeah, that's Jeff fuel for astronomers right there. So when you come here to Argentina, you will you will taste the dulce de leche. Yeah, real, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it's the best. A, uh, yes, uh, and also my uh, my fiance in every birthday of me uh, pre uh, prepares a cake with we call um, chocolate chocolate bariloche from the the south wow. of my country wow. because it has chocolate dulce de leche and uh, manteca uh, uh, <laughs> Adrian is here too. Well, yeah, we're back. Decided, decided <laughs> I would join. Yeah, we got yeah, Adrian. Got... Let, let's let's see who all's here with us right now. So we've got uh, uh, Kareem Jeffer and um, Jerry Hobbles with us. Uh, Maxi Maxi is here with us from Argentina, and DT still on, and Adrian. So it's all great. Um, we are going to go to you, uh, Kareem, uh, next. Uh, Can we start by just repeating how amazing the three young ladies were oh, in the absolutely. first session. Absolutely, right. Ma Maxie you know. and I were just raving about them earlier. <laughs> like, yeah, that was yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so, uh, you know, as I saw this kind of all come together today because literally I just invited uh, Sabella. I, I got a message from her dad. It was just chatting with me on text, you know, and uh, he said, I think that you might enjoy this. and. He sent me a link and I, I saw her video and I just go, oh my goodness. I said, can he come on to the Global Star Party tonight? You know, so I, I thought, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, I'm careful when it comes to, um, you know, having kids come on to a program like this. You know, I want them to be, you know, uh, good with that. I want their parents to be good with it and everything. I invited both her dad and her to be on at the same time. Uh, so uh, he said, well, let me check with Sabella and I'll get right back to you. And so I get a phone call about five minutes later and Sabella said, no, she wants to come on by herself and uh, she wants to do this. So I thought, well, that's great, you know, so. So, but uh, courage to the parents' blessing, you know. Talk to everyone, ex uh, express uh, what she did, and yeah. and also uh, uh, deep tea and um, uh, Libby. Uh, Libby, sorry, uh, yeah, Libby. Mm -hmm. They are living in in a huge a air area area of uh, uh, astronomy. Uh, yeah. ast astronautics and everything. When I was a little boy, I only see documentals on Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and and VHS uh, movies. You know, VHS. Dad, wow, VHS. Old. So, <laughs> yes, I'm <remember> 31. <laughs> and I had yeah. a few of those myself. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm still having two. And. I still think Beta is going to win. I'm still holding out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm holding out. No, no, the video out discs. For. You know those big video discs. Yeah, the big, the big, yeah, the laser discs. The laser yeah. discs. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, those are being converted too. What I'm mm -hmm. holding out hope for, Kareem, is uh, that we don't have as a lot of clouds when we go out and try and uh, image <laughs> and view parts of this eclipse coming. Knock on wood. 
Back on yes. everything mm. I've Fingers got. Fingers crossed. Yep. Tocar madera. Touch, um, touching, yeah. touching wood. No, yeah, Scott, it'll be a, uh, Adrian and I have both joined in with this uh, virtual telescope project to share our images tomorrow morning if we're able oh, to cool. get any. And that way they can be yeah. shared all across and we'll try to put them on the Explorer Scientific as well. Oh, we yeah. Do you, do you have a link for it now? Do you, um, you have I'll see if I, I can find it. Yeah, if you I'll find it too. in the chat, I'll put it in our uh, okay. chat Adrian, stream can you here. Put it in? I will look because I, I had been looking at it um, here. I think he, uh, it was in yeah, email. I think this is yeah. the link right here. Yep, Excellent. I found the email. All right, Adrian, just send it right over to me here in chat. Yeah. And, and we've, we got, will... uh, we've got a couple of our RASC members who are going up uh, north of Thunder Bay to get into the path of annularity so that they can try to catch the full annular view. And then we've Good. reached out to a couple in the Northern Territories in Iqaluit. We're hoping we can get a few images. That would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. If I get any at all, it'll be partial. I've opted to just go to where I think cloud <clears throat> cover will, will be minimum. Although the cloud club cover forecasts are ever changing. Uh, Whitefish Point is supposed to be the best place um here in michigan to see it it's way at the top of michigan so yeah. it's it would be a gamble for me to take that six hour drive yeah i would see more partiality <laughs> and more of the sun would be covered if i uh made it up that far but there were cloud forecasts for it and if they rolled in I'd I would have wished i'd have just gone with my first uh instinct okay. and just gone three hours um so okay and i'm also like i have it here i'm also will, planning on calling it? in sick tomorrow I'm put a, so i got two different links here one from it's you the virtual Ukraine, telescope I'll, link i'll put up there and then um let's put this one up from newsweek adrian that you sent over okay. that's great uh, you know kareem before we get started with your program mm -hmm. um we should talk a little bit about the resc and uh, you guys run an amazing outreach program. You, you're the guy that heads it up there. Um, uh, what can you tell us about the RASC Montreal Center? And I mean, is it something that anybody could join from around the, RASC, the world? Yep, we've actually got uh, members from all over the world. Uh, we, right now during COVID times, we're doing a lot online, right? So our clubhouses are all on Zoom, our public events, we've moved all virtual. When mm -hmm. COVID ends and we start having in person, we're going to try to keep some of the online content, especially with workshops. Workshops, clubhouses, our library actually has a computer set up, including a bank of computers for people to be able to do astrophotography processing during our library nights. Wow. So that way we can also stream in Zoom so that, uh, you know, somebody like David Levy, when we have our big general meetings, he's always a part of them, even yeah. though he's, you know, thousands of kilometers away yeah. you know astronomers are the early adopters of all of this stuff anyways you know so uh and we've always had you know uh, we've shared our information around the world now we're able to share it faster almost in real time and um you know and so been, it's uh i think we're all quite comfortable telescopes. yeah we've yeah. been using remote telescopes for a little while now uh we've got one in california run by the rasc but uh, now, thanks to Pete and a few others, we're trying to add on to the Fox network and the LCO and a few others so that we can increase our outreach and we can increase a little bit of the, the depth of the, of the outreach that we do. Yeah, very cool. That's great. All right. All right. Um, and I, I appreciate you sent over your bio. I'm going to learn more about you. Uh, I'm learning about you as, as, we, <laughs> as we interact on this program. But... Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'll be making um, an ambassador page with you on it, and we'll be pointing back to the RASC. And so, um, yes. you know, anyways, I'm, I'm honored that you have come on to the program as often as you have. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. I'm enjoying it. Tonight, I actually, I started at our clubhouse meeting talking about uh, ancient and indigenous stories of the eclipse, like I did for our previous GSP 47. Yep. And uh, so today it's, it's going to be fun to talk about uh, the life of a star. And I just need to specify it's the astronomical kind, not the other Hollywood stars that we're talking about. Hmm. Um, 
when yeah. Scott told me the topic for this one, I, I started kind of thinking about the different things that we can offer in terms of a talk. And I was considering the exoplanets, but then Jerry's fantastic with that. So I thought, you know, let me talk a little bit about the actual, just the life of a star. And Deepti did a fantastic job setting the stage for this. She went over a little bit of every part of formation of the star, what how a star stays stable, and then how stars end. So what I want to do is I want to just kind of add in a few elements and a few images and visuals for each of those stages to really kind of make it clear what we mean when we say a star, because there's so many different things that we picture when we talk about stars, whether it's astronomers or whether it's people sitting on the side of the road and we're talking to them about what they see in the night sky, we're sharing our telescope views with them. So I wanted to spend a bit of time talking about that. Um, before I do, I, I talked to Scott a little bit about the RASC and the RASC Montreal Center. And I just wanna mention, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about this program that we launched on, on International Astronomy Day called Creation Station. And seeing Deepti, Libby and Sibella today, I love seeing this passion in astronomy coming from young people. And so what we've set up at the RASC is a space in our website for kids to share their imagination about space, whether it's short stories, whether it's poems, whether it's comics, whether it's drawing, it's just something that you feel represents the way you think about space, we'd love to share it with the world. So if you're interested, there's still time till June 13th to go into the first stage of Creation Station. Uh, mm. Visit rasc.ca slash creation station and take a look through, see some of the inspiration that you can get for your imagination. And then here at the RASC, we're currently working towards our General Assembly. And I loved hearing earlier from John about the uh, ALCON, the Astronomy League convention at the end of the summer, because we're doing our GA at the start of the summer. So our members can actually attend both. And our GA is open to everyone. It's not just for RASC members. It's 100% virtual. And the very first day, June 25th, is specifically for youth. The entire day is programming for youth by youth. So the presenters will be youth, the workshop coordinators will be youth, and the administrators who are organizing that day are all youth members. So if you're in the States and you wanna join, go to rasc.ca, go to the GA website, and you can feel free to join. It's $10 Canadian for youth. That's in American, it's about the price of a Big Mac trio. So if you, <laughs> if you skip one lunch, you can come to the GA. That's right. And then the Saturday, Sunday, there's programming for everyone. So that's also available for anyone to attend. It's only the general meeting that's for members only. Everything else is open to everyone. Now, tonight's talk is actually, it's motivated from a project that a student did at John Abbott College a couple of years ago. When I started doing the astronomy outreach, I reached out into some of the other departments and one of the arts teachers from arts and sciences decided to take her final project and have it inspired by our astronomy library. And one of the products that came out of that was a pitch for what would be a nice mural on stellar evolution. So Eva Goldblatt, the student who came up with this, read through some of the books that we had in the library, talked to a bunch of the astronomers, talked to me about the science of stars and how they're born and how they age. And she put together this schematic and said, I would love to see this at the planetarium. So we made it into an actual pitch. And lo and behold, last year, it's now a actual mural on the wall of the planetarium in wow. one of the workshop rooms for elementary school kids. So when they go there, they see this whole mural and text in both languages, English and French, explaining what this mural is showing you. And that's what I wanna do in today's presentation. I wanna like actually walk you through the stages of a star. To do that, we're gonna start with the star that's closest to us, the sun. I remember I was talking to one of my colleagues in, in the UK and he was saying that his earliest memory was about astronomy was somebody telling him that if you took the sun and you shrank it to the size of the dot on top of an eye on a typewriter, the nearest next star will be 15 kilometers away. So in terms of scale, our sun is our star. It's what we can study 
because every other star for us to study is so, so far away that we really have to develop our understanding of stars based on the one that's right beside us. So here's a picture taken by one of our members this past Sunday of the sun with visible light with the solar filter. And you can see a couple of small sunspots. You can't see too much else, but when we take it in hydrogen alpha, we can see a prominence in one corner. We can see it's relatively quiet. Today I went out, I was working on my equipment to try to get ready for tomorrow morning's annular eclipse. And I took mm -hmm. one more picture of the sun and there's still that prominence, but there's another prominence that's actually a triple loop just on the, around 9.30 on the, on the circle. And you've got that prominence that's now around one o'clock. And so our sun looks relatively quiet, both in visual light and right now in hydrogen alpha. We're just coming out of a solar minimum. But when we bring all of our tools together and all of the different wavelengths with which we can see our sun, it actually is incredibly dynamic in its behavior. And when we bring all of our tools together to examine these stars, we really start to understand what makes these stars tick. Now, our sun appears to us to be huge. You look at sunspots and the majority of sunspots, the majority of prominences and flares are all larger than the size of the Earth. Today, the flare that I was looking at just off of the corner of the sun was about two Earths in size. Even compared to Jupiter, the king of our planets, the sun is huge. When we compare it to some of the other stars that we can see in the night sky, the sun oh. doesn't look quite so big. Wow. Our soul is incredibly small compared to a lot of these giants, right? Betelgeuse has been an object of interest for years, <clears throat> and especially last year when it was dimming all of a sudden, and we were trying to figure out what was happening, why it was getting so much dimmer than it normally does in that part of the cycle. We spent a lot of time trying to understand the models of these large stars. So it's important to recognize that there's a limit to what we see when we look at stars. Now, astronomers tend to plot stars on what's called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. If you take the brightness of the star, the luminosity, and the temperature of the star, which you can get off of the main maximum color intensity that comes off that star, like a black body. And that's something that Sabella actually referred to in her color wheel by equating the colors to temperatures, that's what she was talking about with black body radiation. When you do that, you find that there's a lot of stars that fall on this line called the main sequence. And those are the stars that are burning hydrogen at their core, they're fusing hydrogen into helium, and they're the 90% of the stars in the Milky Way. Those are the things that we refer to typically when we think a star, their main sequence, they're fusing hydrogen, they're giving energy to combat gravity pushing inward. But then there's these giants which are incredibly luminous and incredibly large, even though they're cooler. Because they're so big, they give off a ton of brightness. And so even if they're really far away, we will see more of those than we will the regular types of stars, the main sequence stars, because they're smaller. So they're harder to see from far away. And so if we look at our nearest stars, the ones that are the hardest to see are the dimmest ones, but those are ones that might be incredibly plentiful, like red dwarfs and white dwarfs. So what we want to do when we come up with a model of what stars are is we want to encompass not just what we see, but the bias in why we only see certain populations of stars. Hmm. So we start with the sun, the main sequence, the one that we can see and test and observe the most. And in these main sequence stars, we talk about what happens inside the sun. So at the core of the sun, hydrogen is fusing into helium. And that energy generation in the core is what keeps the star stable. Because every single object in the universe, everything made of mass is attracted to everything else from gravity. That's the universal law of gravitation. That's what describes all the orbits. That was, that's what describes why we think dark matter exists is because the motion we see <clears throat> requires mass more than what we can measure. So when we're talking about gravity, it's something that's so intrinsically accepted that we know that these stars, all of the bits, all the gas that makes up these stars is trying to squeeze really close together. And what's keeping that from happening is this energy generation from the inside. Because as stuff gets squeezed close together, when I talk to kids, the thing I try to talk to them about is, all right, if you're in the backseat of the car 
by yourself, you're happy. If another couple of your siblings or your friends are in the car with you, you start to get jostled around. In a school bus, when more and more kids come in the school bus, you get jostled around and you get more and more energetic, more and more violent because you need your space. You want your space. Gas is like that too. When you push it closer and closer together, it moves around more because it's, it's resisting that pressure to get really, really close together. And that motion, that kinetic energy, that movement is, a, is how we measure temperature. That is what temperature is. So as the gravity pushes inwards on this material, if the temperature is high enough, then as the gas gets moved closer and closer together, it can fuse to form new elements. And in a main sequence star, that's what happens in the center. At a temperature of 15 million degrees, hydrogen fuses into helium, giving off energy that pushes outward through a radiative zone. Now, one of the neatest things about the sun is that energy that's formed in the center moves through this radiative zone where it gets absorbed, re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted, and the energy keeps colliding into particles and particles collide into each other. That's so many interactions that it cools off as it goes out towards the convective zone. Hmm. And then the sun is differentiated into this convective zone that acts kind of like a lava lamp where you take hotter fluid at the bottom and as it moves to the top, it cools up. And that takes you from a temperature of 15 million at the core to close to 6,000 Kelvin on the surface. That process takes 100,000 years for the energy created at wow. the core of the sun to get out to the surface. And then from there, it takes just over eight minutes to get to us here on Earth. And that is the energy that gives us life here on Earth. And that's why it's so crucial that our sun is a stable main sequence star because we can rely on relatively the same amount of energy all the time. Recently, the Parker Space Probe went by Venus and took measurements of Venus's density of its atmosphere. And they compared it to earlier measurements which were taken during a solar maximum. And what they found is that the density of the atmosphere of Venus changes according to the solar maximum and solar minimum, according to how many sunspots the sun has and how much energy it's radiating out and how that energy comes out. So our earth is far enough away that we're relatively stable through solar maximum and solar minimum. It may not be the case for planets like Venus that are much, much closer to our star. Now, when we look out into the night sky, we look at the constellations and we see that they're made of all these stars that form a pattern in our minds. And Orion is one of the ones that I love looking at all through the winter time. And one of the reasons I love looking at Orion is even with binoculars, you can spot the Orion Nebula there just under the belt. Now, this is one of the pictures that I took with the RASC robotic telescope and processed. And then I gave it to the students to process as well as one of the projects that they do in my course. And we spend a lot of time on the Orion Nebula because it's actually a nebula where we can see star formation happening. And all of that gas and dust that we see is giving rise to new stars. But what's fascinating is a couple of years ago, the, astrophys the astronomy photo of the day was this image of the Orion Nebula. It's an image taken of 212 hours of exposure stacked over two years, 2013 to 2014, 1400 separate images. And wow. I have trouble seeing the Orion Nebula in this. Scott, do you see it? <laughs> I, I see it, but it's only it's because I know, I know so where I it is, but it is a lost in a bunch of nebulosity. Exactly. So look at how much gas and nebulosity there is there. And we mm -hmm. focus on the Orion Nebula and the Horsehead Nebula and the Flame Nebula because they're really easy for us to capture with just a couple of pictures or even just one long exposure but the amount of nebulosity in this region makes it really rich for us to look at for star formation mm -hmm. because stars form from the gas and dust of this interstellar medium. So what is the interstellar medium? The interstellar medium is not just the leftover stuff from the start of the universe, the hydrogen that began the universe, the helium with a little bit of lithium and a little bit of beryllium. It's also 
extra elements that have been created from the death of other stars and the collisions of galaxies. And mm -hmm. these other heavier atoms, what are called metals, of course, in astronomy, those make up just a small portion of the interstellar medium. But the interstellar medium is not just gas. It also has a little bit of actual dust, microscopic solid grains. This is anything from like small molecules to actual grains of silicates or even hydrocarbons in some cases. Hmm. So the interstellar medium has a rich deposit of material that can create stars. And as those stars are formed, how they're formed, I'll talk about it in a moment, but as they're formed, they'll pull in as much of the material around them as they're able to for whatever the stellar processes are. And it turns out that whatever cloud creates each protostar only takes up about 30% of the hydrogen from that cloud. The rest of the hydrogen is left behind. And we're not 100% sure why. Initially, we thought it was those jets coming out of these T tori protostars before they actually turn on and become main sequence stars, before hydrogen fusion starts, these jets are coming off because the stars are spinning and the accretion disk, this cloud is spinning around it. We thought that that's the reason why it pushes away some of the material, but it doesn't seem like it from our studies of the Orion Nebula. So what it actually appears is that once the process of the protostar being formed gets to a certain stage, it now is the material that's already there collapsing and it's not bringing in any more material. It's now forming that balance, that hydrostatic equilibrium that will mm. give us a new star. The rest of that material is left behind and can form planetary systems. And that's one of the things that we're looking at right now with our development of the theory of how planets are formed for exoplanet systems. And if we look at the Orion Nebula right now, there are many spots where you can see protostars or even stars themselves being made. Now these protostars, there's different, different stages of how these stars are formed. You know, first you have what are called Bach globules, which is when the nebulae get a dense region that's just about to form a star. Then the actual collapse begins, and those are herbig harrow objects. And then the moment before they're really ready to become main sequence stars, before hydrogen fusion happens, when those jets are coming out incredibly fast and there's lots and lots of energy in the accretion from that collapsing cloud, those are T tauri stars. Okay. All of those are observed in the Orion Nebula. And we can see these stages of star formation up close as we look through. So what we believe happens is when you have this cloud of interstellar material, something shocks it, some sort of pressure wave comes through, whether that's a star dying somewhere, whether it's a couple of different star systems getting very close together and perturbing each other, or even whether it's an object moving through them very, very quickly, like a roaming black hole, which is one of the actual suppositions of these stellar black holes that are actually roaming through regions. Whatever it is that causes this shock wave causes part of the cloud to become really, really dense. And as it becomes really, really dense, bits of it start to come close together. And that's what creates this protostar, this Bach globule. And that's what starts the star formation. Mm. But these clouds are huge. Like you saw that picture of the Orion Nebula. These clouds can be incredibly immense which means most of the time stars aren't born on their own. Even incredibly bright stars like Sirius A, uh, the Sky News astrophoto of the day, just, uh, of the week is actually a displacement orbital composite of Sirius B around Sirius A taken by one of our Quebec astronomers. Most stars in our galaxy and we believe in the universe are actually born in systems a binary, tertiary, four stars, five star systems, or clusters of stars like the Pleiades. And the Pleiades is one of my favorite cluster of stars because it looks like it's just the seven sisters surrounded by a ton of dust still left over. Right. It's actually over a thousand stars in that cluster. 
Wow. So those clusters can either be full clusters where they're actually orbiting around a common center of mass or just stellar associations, a group of stars that form together, but they're not really gravitationally bound to each other. But the key is all of these stars were formed right around the same time. So when we study clusters, we study stars that all began at the same age, but there are different stages of evolution depending on how much mass they have. And Deepke actually referred to this. When you have a protostar just starting out, if it has a ton of mass, really, really, really massive, like close to 40 solar masses, it can reach main sequence hydrogen fusion in 100,000 years. But if you have a star closer to our sun's mass, it can take over a billion years for it to actually reach stable stellar fusion. So these stars all form differently, they all evolve differently. And one thing we know is that all of these stars, when they reach main sequence, they are fusing hydrogen in the center. What happens when the hydrogen runs out? When the hydrogen runs out, most stars, the vast majority of stars, will start to compress more, right? Because the hydrogens run out. And as they compress more, they heat up. As they heat up, the outer envelope from the core now gets hot enough to fuse hydrogen. While the core gets hotter and hotter and hotter, hopefully till it gets to 100 million degrees and it can start to fuse helium. So now you have helium fusing in the center and hydrogen fusing in the shell. Well, if hydrogen is fusing in the shell and that creates energy, that star blossoms into a giant. And that's the giant stage that most stars, the vast majority of them reach when they run out of hydrogen fuel in the core. Because there's still hydrogen on the outside of the star. It's only at the core that they've run out. And at the core, this helium can start to fuse. And that helium that starts to fuse now creates energy in the core and more energy is being created on the outside. So some of these stars actually start to pulse. And those are variable stars. And there's many different types of variable stars. So as these stars go through, I said most of the stars become giants because the lowest mass stars never actually differentiate. They never develop the core, the convective zone, the radiative zone, all of that. They actually constantly are convective, which means that the hydrogen in the entire star gets to fuse, not just the part in the core. So hmm. those ones burn incredibly slowly. They never become hot enough to start a helium fusion, and they just continue to burn for billions and billions of years, and then they cool off into black dwarf. Those are red dwarf, and those are an incredible number of stars. Hmm. Medium mass stars are closer to our sun. Our sun will become a giant, and when it becomes a giant, that outer shell is going to cause a whole bunch of mass to be pushed outwards. But it never gets hot enough to go past the helium stage in the center. So what happens <clears throat> when the helium runs out, now you have a ton of mass really far out from that core and the core has now run out of helium to fuse. So now the star starts to collapse inward. And as it starts to collapse inwards, all of the stuff on the outside gets pushed outwards. And that creates this ring of dust and gas that we see forming beautiful nebulae like the ring nebulae the Owl Nebula, the Helix Nebula. They're gorgeous, gorgeous objects in our night sky. Those are the expanding shell of gas that's giving off energy in incredible wavelengths, mostly from hydrogen with a little bit of helium, a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of silicate, et cetera. But at the core, the stuff is still collapsing. Gravity is still pushing inwards. And it's not hot enough to get to carbon fusion so it keeps collapsing inwards until it reaches an actual quantum limit. Quantum physics is a realm of physics that deals with the subatomic. What happens when particles get really, really close together or when you get to the actual size of particles? And it turns out that electrons, the negatively charged particles in our atoms, 
can't occupy the same state as any other electron. And that electron degeneracy, this lack of ability of electrons to share energy values, share quantum states, results in an object called a white dwarf, which is stable as long as it's not too massive. So up mm. until a mass of about 1.4 solar masses, <clears throat> a white dwarf is completely stable and it will just sit there hot and give off its energy. So it's not very luminous. Some of them are really hot, but they cool down relatively quickly. But those white dwarfs are absolutely stable as long as they stay with a mass under 1.4 solar masses. Problem is, remember I said most stars are born in systems of more than one star? Mm -hmm. So if you have a companion star and a white dwarf, that companion star, when it reaches giant stage, part of its material might enter the gravitational pull of the white dwarf, in which case it'll pull that material onto its surface. And that creates what's called a novae. And that's like the one that we've been watching in Cassiopeia for the last two months. It's mm. a flash of mass igniting on the surface of a white dwarf. And it's from the fact that this mass is adding on to the white dwarf and reaching that electron degeneracy stage. But then we might ask what happens if the white dwarf gets too much of this <clears> mass? And if it exceeds its 1.4 solar masses, its limit, you get a type 1a supernova. And that's one of these standard candles that we use to measure distances in the universe. And the reason is because every white dwarf is pretty much the same thing. It's a bunch of electrons pushing back on the gravity of all the material pushing inwards. And so when it reaches too much and you go past that quantum limit, the explosion is incredibly well-defined. It gives off a certain amount of energy and a certain brightness, an absolute magnitude for the astronomers in the audience of minus 19.6 roughly. And it leaves behind nothing. All of the energy goes into the explosion of the material outwards. So you're left with nothing behind and this incredible burst of energy and interstellar matter. But then you have larger stars. And the larger stars, when they start to form and when they start to collapse, they're not as easy to predict as medium stars like our sun. The Bubble Nebula is an incredible example of what's called a wolf rayet star. It's a young O star, incredibly hot, incredibly variable. It gives off a ton of energy and the Energy is not just coming off as energy, it's also actually solar wind. It's hot gas being expelled from this star constantly. And that hot gas hits the cold gas of the interstellar medium, creating this bubble. Hmm. And when you subtract the stars, you can see that bubble incredibly clearly. Hmm. That bubble is actually the interaction of the hot stellar wind from this young O star with the cold interstellar medium surrounding it. These larger stars, these hotter stars, as they run out of hydrogen and they move to helium, and then they run out of helium, they get hot enough to fuse carbon, and then they get hot enough to fuse oxygen and neon and so many elements, because at each stage, as they press further and further inwards, the temperature gets high enough because there's enough gravity pushing down that more and more and more and more fusion can happen to give off just that little bit of energy to keep it alive, to keep that star alive until you get to iron. As you go through these stars, hydrogen, best life, best source of energy, lasts for a really long time, 7 billion years. Then you have helium, 500,000 years, carbon, 600 years, oxygen, half a year, silicon, one day. And when it finishes fusing its, silly, its silicon, it's left with iron. And iron can't produce energy, it costs energy. So now all of a sudden, because it costs energy, the star continues to collapse. Now your end product depends on how much of that star is left because the giant stage happened. It 
shoved off a bunch of material when the giant stage happened. And at each of these stages, at each of these fusion stages, more and more of the outside of the star gets pushed out. But as that core collapses, when it reaches iron, if the core that's left is less than about three and a third solar masses or 3.2 solar masses, you end up with a neutron star. You push past the electron degeneracy, electrons and protons combine to form neutrons, and you're left with a neutron star in the center. And that neutron star, when it's formed, all of that energy, all of that material pushing inwards to the neutron star rebounds with energy. And that rebounding energy goes through all of that material that the star had pushed out. And now you have extra energy going through all of these elements, everything from iron to hydrogen, which means you create heavier elements up to gold, platinum, you name it. And that's why we say we're made of star stuff, because these dying stars, when they supernovae, <clears throat> energy they give off creates all of those heavier elements. Now with the Crab Nebula, you actually can see just over the last 10 years, you can see that nebula continuing to expand. This is an amazing dynamic. Oh yeah, this is, this is one of my favorite images. Exactly. I mean, this is, this is remarkable that you can actually see the pulse as this is continuing to move outwards for this amazing nebula that was created a long, long time ago, right? Like this is the supernova of 1054 and it's still right. bursting outward. Those of us who are into astrophotography, one of the best targets in Cygnus is the Veil Nebula. And the Veil Nebula is a remnant of a supernova from 5,000 to 8,000 years ago. So it's what the Crab Nebula will become in another 4,000 to 6,000 years. And that remnant from a star that's about 1,500 light years from Earth, it stretches three degrees in the night sky. Hmm. And you can see not just the, the hydrogen, but also some of the oxygen and some <clears throat> of the silicon giving off these amazing wavelengths and this energy that you can still track through to rebuild the picture of what that supernovae looked like. Now, what if you exceed that 3.2 solar masses? The neutron degeneracy, that quantum state can no longer hold back all of that material pushing inwards. And that's where physics comes to uh, singularity. We don't know of any process that can hold back the complete implosion of all the material left the over the 3.2 solar masses at that supernovae level. So when that supernova happens and it comes closer and closer and closer inwards, it collapses to a singularity. And that singularity takes all of that mass and combines it somewhere to a point inside. Now, we don't know what it looks like inside there because the gravity is so strong that light can't escape. That event horizon prevents us from seeing any structure or any evidence of what's happening at the center of those black holes. But what we do know is that we've seen observations of these black holes by looking at binaries where there's clearly a star orbiting something. And that something has clear stellar mass that's in the range that we are looking at for larger than a neutron star and it's really, really fast rotations, fast orbital movement, but there's nothing there that we can detect. And if there's nothing there that we can detect, but the mass is so large, it fits our prediction of what a black hole would be. So these stars that we see in the night sky, they come from the interstellar medium. As they run out of fuel, they give back to the interstellar medium. And their end projects become these incredible complex objects, white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes that really help us to understand both quantum physics and gravity and general relativity, and help us to really see if our theories and our understanding of physics are correct. So 
wishing you clear skies. Look up and enjoy these stars because they really capture both your imagination as well as your ability to understand the way the world works. Thank you. Wow. That's great. That's a great presentation on uh, types of stars, stellar evolution, the reasons that nova exist and how they occur, all of this stuff. Thanks. I'm sorry I went so long. <laughs> no, no, that was great. It was great. Um, there's, uh, uh, you know, I guess there's, you know, several questions that might come up here. Let's see if, so here's Aaron Thompson. He says, if a star has the mass required for a black hole when it is a star and then collapses, why does it not have the gravity of a black hole when it's a star before it collapses? Ah, so it's because the gravity is not collapsed to a singularity. So it's not all at one point, but it's important to recognize that if our sun was replaced by a black hole of the exact same mass, our yeah. orbit wouldn't change. We're not close enough for that orbit to change. And the okay. actual event horizon of the sun is so close inside of the actual object of the sun that most of the mass is outside of that event horizon. So the point of a black hole, that event horizon picture, is that all of that mass has collapsed to a point, to a singularity. And these event horizons are not incredibly large unless the object is massive, like, this, like the, the black holes that are at the center of galaxy. I see. Good answer. Um, any other questions here? I, I had a question, and it's, sure. this is something, uh, the corona of the sun. We talked about how it's incredibly hot at the core and it's getting cooler and cooler until we get to you know, the uh, so-called surface of the star. Um, why or what's happening to make the corona so hot, like hundreds of times hotter than the surface? So that's the magnetic field lines. The magnetic field lines capture the ions and accelerate them in such a way that you end up with trapped plasma, which really creates these hot, hot regions around the corona and around that part of the star. So one mm -hmm. of the really dynamic things about stellar evolution is trying to understand the way in which the magnetic field works. Because for our sun, the magnetic field flips every 11 years. And that flipping of the magnetic field comes from this complexity that happens when you go from solar minimum to solar maximum. You end up okay. with all these sunspots and all these magnetic field lines that wind up with each other. And as they do that, there's more and more energy being captured and stored and released. And that's what gives you that temperature at the corona. I think Jerry had something to add to that. Yeah, that. I picture that is that more like a frictional effect or you know it's 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 turning uh kinetic energy into into heat basically is that right with the magnetic field forcing it's, that material to do that that's what does it for the actual plasma loops yeah yeah but then the area around the plasma loops that's hot ions that seems to be actual magnetic heating and in, in putting together this presentation, uh, did you look at any, maybe any new information coming from like the Parker Solar Probe? I did. And that's one of the interesting things is the solar wind is an entire, an entire talk in and of itself. Because the solar wind, what we thought we understood about it, we're starting to find out that the density changes and how far the solar wind pushes is really different than what we thought. It's, it's part of, I mean, even if you look at Voyager going out past the heliopause and into right. the interstellar medium, we're realizing that our picture of the heliopause and how far our solar wind extends was actually pretty, pretty good out mm. there. But close mm -hmm. to the sun, our picture isn't complete. And so the Parker Space Probe right now, with the, with, especially with the sampling it's doing around 10,000 kilometers from the surface, Mm -hmm. It's giving amazing data, and uh, it's amazing. really causing us to revisit our hydrostatic equilibrium models. Right. Fantastic. Kareem, thank you so much. My thank pleasure. You so much. Uh, up next is uh, Jerry Hubble from the Mark Slater Remote Observatory. Um, 
He's at his mission control right now. And uh, Jerry um, has done a lot of programs with me. Um, he, he and I were, uh, I think that we kind of brainstormed the idea of, of having something like a global star party uh, way back when. And um, uh, we started uh, the GSPs in, I think it was August 4th of last year. And, uh, and we're mm -hmm. quickly climbing up. Our next one next week will be the 50th one. So Jerry, thanks for all your contributions and all the great work you've done and outreach and just uh, inspiration sure. overall. So, it's, yeah. so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Scott. I uh, I appreciate that very much, and uh, I'm I'm starting to think that I'm into too many different things. It's just <laughs> there's a lot that I'm involved with in astronomy, and it, and it's because I'm just so excited about learning different things about astronomy, and that's something that uh, that amateurs, I guess, you start to get into certain things, and then you discover new things, and you say, oh, I want to go into that now, or I want to go into this now. And that kind of drives your uh, equipment purchases and other things that you're into, you know, as your as your so-called astronomy career, your personal hobby uh, grows and changes over time. And I think people will will see that. Uh, and so there's nothing to there's nothing out out there that you'll ever lose your passion about if you if you keep learning. And one of the most recent things that I've gotten into over the last three or four years is exoplanets. I started out really interested uh, 10, 12 years ago when I got back into astronomy. I was a visual astronomy astronomer during, you know, when I was in high school. And then during the 80s, I got a nicer smith cassegrain Green telescope, and then I got away from it. And then 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I, I started looking at what the technology was doing in astronomy. And I'd always been interested in asteroids. And being able to track asteroids and image their position and calculate orbits and stuff like that and that's kind of what started me down this my most recent uh astronomy career basically 10 12 13 years ago and uh but it's evolved i mean i learned about astrometry which is a measurement of position in the sky and then I learned about photometry and, and how to do brightness calculations and measurements of different objects, you know, uh, asteroids, minor planets, and other things. And then when you start getting into photometry, you learn about light curves, okay, and how things change. And that's really when it gets exciting because that's really what astronomy is about, is about change in the universe. It's not this static picture. I talk about it with Scott all the time. When we were kids, we learned about the fixed stars, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the solar system was more dynamic, but the stars were fixed, but that's not the case at all. There's change all around us. And so that's, what's exciting about astronomy. And, and, um, you know, there's two, two different sides of astronomy for most, most amateurs. And I don't like the term. I mean, amateur astronomer means you love astronomy for it, what it is. But again, I like to I like to say we're all just astronomers. Professionals manage to make money at it, and and amateurs love it for what it is. But we're <clears> all astronomers, and you and you learn how how to do things. Uh, and so, astronomers everywhere can learn about the science of astronomy or how to do beautiful pictures. And I've always more been into the science of it, but there's nothing wrong with beautiful pictures because it really helps bring astronomy to to the to the world, basically, and gets people interested in it. Um, so once I learned about light curves, then you start learning about okay, photometry is a basic fundamental of you know, you know astronomy, just like astron astrometry. You got photometry, then you got spectroscopy. So you got those three pillars of astronomy to do measurements. And you can learn so much about all these different objects using those techniques. And so exoplanets is kind of an extension of that. You, you measure from an, from an amateur astronomy and equipment that we have, you, you learn how to do uh, photometry is applied to exoplanets and it's because of the transit method. Uh, so just like, and it's kind of a coincidence that we have an annular eclipse tomorrow and it's the moon transiting the sun is what that is 
right? It's crossing the face of the sun. And that's exactly how we look at exoplanets. We look at these planets crossing the face of the star and measure the brightness change. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to share my, my uh, screen now. Let me see if I got my correct. Um, thing that I want to show here for right now. Um, I have to select that, make it show up here. So I'm going to go, this is kind of a general thing. Um, I'm just going to go over the basics of what exoplanet absorbing is all about for amateur astronomers and for professionals too. They do, you know, transit method is really one of the most effective ways to uh, search for and, and discover exoplanets. Uh, in the sky, and that's what uh, <clears throat> the Kepler space probe was all about, and, and mm -hmm. looking at for exoplanets, and also the test mission. And the interesting thing about the test thing about the test mission is that it's using four telescopes grouped together that are amateur-sized telescopes. They're four-inch telescopes, <laughs> and they're very wide field, so the pixels are very large in terms of the angular. Uh, size of the pixel, but in terms of the, the telescopes used, it's similar very much to what amateurs use, or actually smaller in some cases. So I thought that was pretty interesting when I learned mm. about the test mission. But I, I wrote this article in Astro and it came out in Astronomy Magazine last week, or last year, I'm saying, uh, about a year ago. And I want to use it to kind of show some graphics here that that really talk about what transits are all about on the exoplanet. And again, so this is a di this uh, on the left is a, a little easy diagram to see how an exoplanet passes in front of the star. And we have to be in line uh, so that we see the actual planet cross in front of the star. Otherwise, if, it, if we're at a different angle, it's called the inclination of the orbit. Uh, we wouldn't see it. So the inclination has to be very tight, uh, close to 90 degrees, which is basically a 90 degree inclination would be a straight line across the star. And, and typically it's like 87, 88 degrees, something like that, which means it's tilted like, like is shown here. And you get a profile of the light when the uh, exoplanet ingresses into the, in, in front of the star and then it passes and then it egresses the star and then goes around. And then once it egresses, of course, you don't see it. All you see is the star. So you get the baseline. Can you see my cursor here pretty good? Mm -hmm. You get the baseline when the exoplanet is outside of the star. And then that's the bright, full brightness of the star. And then as it starts to pass in front, you start to light. You see the light dim a tiny bit. And we're talking uh less than or equal to about one percent change in the light and the brightness and so it dips up to one percent or so and then it settles out once it crosses and it settles out now this is this is not a hundred percent accurate light curve it's very similar it's a flat bottom but it could be curved a little bit on the bottom and then when it egresses it comes back up to normal and that's what a transit is so you're taking a measurement to measure this brightness. It's a 1% dip in the light. To and, and depending on the precision of the measurement, you either can just detect it, which means, yes, that's, a, that's an exoplanet dip. It's got that characteristic shape of an exoplanet. And really the shape, the size of the planet uh, determines how deep the, what the depth of that dip is and also how flat or how long this flatness of the bottom is. So for example, if you, to compare this to a binary star system where you have one star passing in front of the other, and let's say um, the light, um, you got two different stars, one's bigger than the other, and one's gonna be brighter than the other. So you're gonna have the light changing as one passes in front of the other. But the, but the size of this, um, other star is going to be such a significant size compared to the, the main star is that you're going to have more of a V-shaped curve. It's going to come way down, maybe have a short 
flat section and come way up and the depth is going to be much greater uh, with a binary star system an eclipsing binary is what it's called so that's the difference that's how you can tell if it's an exoplanet compared to an eclipsing binary is the shape of this curve also <clears throat> that's part of what we do when we uh, detect whether it's an exoplanet or an eclipsing binary and that was part of the mission of the ground team for the test team. So tests could only detect whether the light dimmed or not. They didn't know, and the pixel size was so large that you couldn't tell which star it was coming from. So we, they, we rely on ground-based systems to do a higher precision measurement and to spatially determine which star in the background is actually causing the dip or actually being eclipsed or transited. Um, and that's part of the mission of the ground teams um, of the test mission follow-up team. Um, and they have, to, they have to determine whether it's an eclipsing binary or if it's an actual transit. That's the job of the uh, seeing limited group that I'm a member of with the test team is to say, oh, is this a, an eclipsing binary or, or uh, is it, an actual exoplanet candidate. So that's that's part of that. And one of the things um, I'll get into, let's see, what else can I talk about? So that's basically how, how um, the measurement works. You just make the measurement with the brightness. Now, one of the other things that I did um, at the Mark Slade Remote Observatory, Observatory two or three years ago is I discovered a paper about um, a new method that professionals were using with a new type of filter. Uh, it's not really a filter, it's more of a, um, it's, uh, it's called a, uh, an engineered uh, diffuser. It creates a light pattern on your, on your imager that's different than a normal star profile. And it's done that way for a specific reason. So you get a highly precise measurement of the light. One of the things you can do um, to increase the precision of the measurement is to gather more of the light. <clears throat> and in order to do that without overexposing, you have to spread the light out so that you have more pixels measuring that, that star brightness. So, they, so that you, have, you don't overexpose the light, so you gather more photons. Basically the key to precision is to gather as many photons as you can get away with. And the only way to gather, gather more photons when you have a bucket that can only have so many photons in it, which is what a pixel is, it's like a bucket, you can only fill up so much is to have more buckets. So you're trying to gather, like for example, if you wanna gather a, a swimming pool's worth of rain when it's raining instead of just a bathtub, then you have to have more buckets, right? to gather all those, all that rain. And that's what you're trying to do is to measure, to gather all that light to be able to do a high, uh, higher precision measurement of the light to get the, uh, to be able to detect and to measure these transits. So this engineered diffuser is used to spread the light out into a specific profile. And this is on the right here is what, uh, what, what it kind of looks like. And then you can do this, you do an annulus and an aperture measurement. It's called a um, differential photometry, aperture differential photometry, uh, where you compare the light from one star to the other to measure the change in brightness of that light. Um, so that's the method. It's a, foot, a precision photometric method using that uh, diffuser. And uh, here's another couple of um, diagrams that kind of show um, when you gather more light, statistically, uh, whenever you measure any kind of radiation, the more signal you have, the higher the signal to noise ratio. Uh, the signal goes up much faster than the noise does, basically, because it's a square root function. So the signal, so if you take the statistically this the square root of the signal is equal to the noise so as you get much more signal this you take the square root of the signal the noise ratio goes up which is what's shown in this graph and that gets you the precision you need to be able to measure the light uh, to detect these transits uh, these exoplanet transits um, one other thing 
Let me see. Is a standard standard uh, light when it's when it's out of focus from a star. It's got this point spread function. It's like this Gaussian bell shaped curve across the CCD image. All right, so that's what it looks like in the profile. The brightness of the pixels goes up with this curve and then comes back down when it uh, across several pixels. But the diffuser makes it um, kind of a flat profile. You can see it's, it's called the top hat profile. And <clears throat> so that helps you to do a more precise measurement also. That, that diffuser really helps you to spread the light out, which is what you want but also that makes it uh, much better and more consistent. One of the things that you deal with with noise is not just uh, the so-called shot noise or the uh, statistical noise of the light, but also scintillation when the sky moves around and it's jumping around and you're trying to do this measurement. That, that's a source of noise. This, this uh, diffuser helps to mitigate that because it actually projects light across this whole profile and makes it real steady. So that's one of the things that helps to do a highly precise measurement also. And this is on the left here, you can see what this filter looks like. It's not really a filter, but it's a, a diffuser. It's kind of looks like a frosted glass in a way. Um, here's what our system looks like in the Mark Slade Remote Observatory. It's a six inch six and a half inch uh, APO refractor um, on our G11 mount. Um, and it's it's typical size for amateur uh, instrument. Now this is a big refractor, of course, it's a very expensive one, but in terms of light gathering capability, you can buy uh, telescopes that have eight, 10, 12 inch objectives that are that can gather much dimmer light than this than what we can gather and uh, do this similar type of work uh, with a schmidt cassegrain type telescope so mm -hmm. that's an overall look at how exoplanet uh, exoplanets are observed and measured excellent we've uh, we've talked at various times in the past about this diffuser and using this diffuser method. Um, when the th there's advantages to using this diffuser, uh, being uh, uh, that it can cancel out uh, scintillation problems. Right. And, um, and also maybe some uh, drive tracking, error problems. Right, tracking errors. So yeah. The, uh, yeah, that so it mitigates that stuff quite a bit. So it really brings the capability to instruments and systems that aren't as you know, highly developed as professional systems are with their tracking ability and their, um, and other things that are involved with getting these, you know, high dollar systems to, to be perfect or as they can be. And it brings it down to where you can, as an amateur, you can um, work around these problems. Not, not, I wouldn't say work around, I would say uh, mitigate the issue basically yeah. with seeing scintillation and, um, and tracking. And this uh, diffuser is relatively low cost. It's very so similar in price to a standard photometric filter system, any of the, you know, V-band or uh, Cousins, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Johnson Cousins filters. It's about the same, you know, high quality filter. Right. Well, up next is uh, uh, Cesar Brolo and uh, Pedro Cesar. Uh, uh, Caesar has been on um, maybe all, <laughs> I think maybe he's missed maybe one or two global star parties. Yeah. Uh, uh, Pedro has been on, I think, only once or twice uh, before. And uh, uh, Pedro is a um, research scientist. Uh, uh, and uh, I think you studied in um, Ohio. Is that right, Pedro? Uh, I, I yes, I, I did my PhD degree in Ohio State, and um, yes. well, I've been teaching for for many years. I gave up research a long time ago, and uh, and devoted my professional career to teaching, which is a great passion. Teaching and writing also, I was writing mostly. Um, Wonderful. 
So oh. that's what I'm doing now, living here okay. in, in Patagonia. That's great. Well, Caesar, I'll, I'll turn this over to you and uh, uh, let you take it away, okay? Okay, yes. Um, the, the thing that we was talking with Pedro uh, was um, about um, the idea to talk about stars. Um, the coincidence was that you uh, prepare the uh, and especially the, the um, uh, Global safari about stars um, yes. was a great coincidence uh, because we uh, I I start to think uh, to to talk about something that amateurs we have in, in, in our pictures and normally we have the three channels and uh, we uh, can of course the first thing is in our pictures uh, that we make we can see many many difference of uh, colors in the stars. Um, um, the, the idea of tag pictures is not only uh, uh, something like only uh, um, uh, something, well, I, I don't have the, the, the word, but something, something uh, quite uh, or uh, nice uh, pictures, if not, is make us make, make question about the, the color of the stars or especially uh, for me was something like I say, okay, one question is um, what, I, I think that for me it's okay that a, a, a strong star is white or blue, but uh, a, a small star is red in my ideas, in my, my, first, uh, um, my first sensations. Um, uh, but when you talk about a giant red star, um, uh, this is my first uh, question is why? I started to, 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 uh, to think in color of the star uh, when uh, I took a picture of, a, of the area of shovel box uh, in the, uh, near to the Southern Cross and, uh, and a star that is Beta Crucis have a uh, very, very near to this star that is a blue star, a red one that is, uh, that is the, the most red uh, star in the, in the sky. And I, I, I thought at this moment, I say, okay, we need to talk about this. Why, why the stars, why the people say, okay, this star is, is the red, the, the, the Red, the most red uh, star in the sky. And this is uh, uh, why I, I talk with my, my friend uh, Pedro that uh, um, he can uh, explain different things about. Pedro, uh, todo tuyo. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, okay, my connection uh, is uh, unstable, so I, I, I switch to the handphone to see if it helps in Google. I hope you are copying me well because I, I, can't, I couldn't uh, understand half of the things uh, Cesar says, uh, said, even though he, I'm sure he was clear enough. <laughs> it was a connection. Well, but you know, Not, we, because we told earlier. It was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it was my connection, not Cesar's English, which was uh, quite good. So, um, yeah. I, I'm going to show you just a, a little presentation, very brief. Um, I'll do it this. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, well, this is the picture Cesar was talking about. Um, here is Beta Crucis, one of the brightest stars in the Southern Cross, and um, and here is the jewel box. And uh, you see there are many many uh, stars that look white, but if we look close enough, we see that some of them look a little bit reddish here, here, mm. over here, here. Especially this one. This one looks very red. So it's, it's kind of interesting the fact that, that most of the stars look red in the pictures. Uh, sorry, most look white in the pictures, but the red looks 
spread. Um, something like that happens when we look at the stars visually as well. Uh, the, the, uh, most of the stars look white, but there are a few very bright stars that are reddish. Um, so it's um, it's a classical question: why why the stars look like that, right? Um, we cannot answer like the sun says: uh, the sky is blue and so on. Um, but the stars, some stars are red, and uh, as Cesar says, some uh, some some of the most luminous stars in the sky are also red giants. So they are red and high, highly luminous, even though we tend to think that the red stars are, are small and, and important. Um, so how do we answer this and how we can, especially how can you uh, take a, a, a glimpse at all these things uh, with your own images of the sky, right? Um, so what I did was to ask Cesar, well, okay, share with me the original, uh, the, 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 the original pictures that you took for, to, before you made this composite photo and um, taken in, in R, G, and B, right? In red, green, and blue. I, I kept only the, the red and blue, and this, this is just a, this little area, I did a little bit of a zoom. This is, this is in, in blue color, and, um, but it looks black and white because it, it, the, the colors will appear when you combine all three, all three filters, all, all three filter photographs. Um, well, you see more or less the same thing we did before, but we, we switch to, to the red to the red photograph. You don't see much of a difference, but if we pay attention here, for instance, this little star on top of the of beta cruises, on top of the big one, this is in blue, this is in red. You can see that the stars change very, very little. They may become all of them a little bit brighter. Just uh, this is probably due to the contrast of the photograph. I don't know. You, you guys are probably more experts than me on, 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 on astrophotography, so you can, inter you can interpret what's going on here. But one, one thing that, that happens is that this star becomes dimmer in, the, in, the, in blue light. In, in, in red light becomes um, brighter. Beta cruises is the other way around. Becomes bright, becomes dimmer. Just the opposite way as the others do. So this intense, this great change is a, it goes beyond what the rest of the stars do, right? You, you can see that all the stars very, very, very little, but this one, these two change a lot. Um, so this has to do with the, with the, the intensities, uh, the intensity of the light across those two filters, right? There is another one here, for instance. You see this, I don't know if I had a, well, I had, I had a, an arrow somewhere here, but uh, I lost it. Um, if you look at the, here uh, at the top left of the bright star here, uh, there's a very faint star. When we go to red, is that one? Uh, no, it's not that one. Well, I, I lost it. I, we, we can, sorry. We can, we can look at, uh, at any rate, we can look at the, um, here the, at the jewel box, the famous uh, red gem in the heart of the of the cross, the the, the same thing happens. Okay. Yes, it's, it's my good because is, my, my picture is not so great. It's uh, with, can you, it's not can, you see the, yeah. can you see this difference there? The difference, okay. yeah. Okay. It's right there in the in the center of, of this little uh, triangle here of the stars. Okay, so how do we explain these things? Um, 
here is uh, you probably know we have you seen this before is the the black the famous black body curve we have here a diagram where in the x-axis we have uh, wavelength and brightness of the stars in relative brightness in the in the vertical axis. Basically, what we see here is how, uh, in a, theoretically, how the, the energy of the star uh, distrib gets distributed across the different wavelengths, and this will be the um, the visible spectrum, the visible wavelength. Uh, this is for the for a star with the temperature similar to, to our sun. So as we can see, most of the light for, for a star like the sun becomes uh, brightest in yellow and green, and something like 70% of that maximum in the blue. So we lose about 30% and we lose about 80% in the red. So there is a little bit of more lost in blue than in the red. That's, it, that's the reason why if you put on blue glasses, uh, then you will see the, the world a lot dimmer than if you put uh, yellow glasses or, or red glasses, with red glass, right? Um, because the sun emits much less blue light than red light or yellow light. Um, if you go into the infrared, it continues dropping into the ultraviolet, it continues dropping, right? Now, what happens with, that, with our red and blue stars? This will be the curve for a red star, right? The peak is in the red, so you can see that in blue and green drops like 40%, and in blue drops down to about 10%. So that means that a red star emits a lot less because this side falls so sharply, oops, falls so sharply, sharply it, uh, you lose uh, a lot of light in, in the rest of the spectrum. That's why the red becomes extremely dominant with respect to the other, to the other colors. Um, but the, the same is not, it's not the same for a blue star. If we have a blue star, this would be like, the previous one was a star of um, um, 3,500 degrees. This one is for a star about 9,000 degrees, right? So the peak is in the, past the, the, the blue, the violet, near into the ultraviolet, and the red is down here. So it continues, loses, energy from the, the blue into the red. So a star like this, we should see mostly blue. So why don't we see blue? Well, very likely in the, the, in the, in the photographs, um, the, the CCDs are more sensitive into the longer wavelengths. So this is probably being leveled off and then you get like a more level curve here, and and, and then um, all the all the wavelengths are sort of even out more or less. Um, there is not that much even that, that that integrates as a as a whitish color, right? I hope I mean clear what I mean. <laughs> um, and in the case of our eyes, we see. Um, our eyes are also centered, are like a filter center in, yeah. in the yellow part of the spectrum. So sure. uh, we um, we also uh, cut off some of the blue light. So um, this sort of levels off and, um, and give us that feeling of observing white. Um, this is more, more so when you look at the stars that are picking in, in in the green, because uh, this peak will be right here in the middle. Um, so basically, when 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 you look at at, at the at the at images taken in different filters, when when the filter is in, in the blue, the, the hottest stars will stand up; they will show brighter. When you look at the filter in the red. Um, the, the cooler stars will stand brightest. So doing 
photometry is like doing broadband spectroscopy. You're you are just uh, cutting chunks of spectrum of the spectrum into into one big piece, right? And um, and and you can play around with images and and try to to hunt for uh, visually which stars are 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 cooler and which stars seem hotter when seeing how much the light changes. Uh, when when you jump from one filter to the next, you can see which stars may be cooler and which stars may be uh, hotter. Um, of course, uh, you, you can find, for instance, you take an image like that, and if you go into a, a software like Stellarium, you can find there um, an, an item that says color index. The, that number gives you an idea of, of how hot or cool the star is. If that number is, is close to, is past one or two, positive one or positive two, that means that the star is, is very cool, it's very cold, and, um, and it, it's, therefore it's a very red star, okay? And uh, then you can compare what you see in your images with your, you find in, in a stellar influence and find the, 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 the measure color of your, of your stars. Um, once we, we understand, understand um, the colors of the stars and how it relates to temperatures, then we can go on and, and, and study the luminosities of the stars and then um, go to the next step, the HR diagram. And that's what uh, Cesar is interested about. So, mm. but that, that would be uh, um, stuff for another yeah. talk, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's something that, that you, you tell us that uh, what, the first thing is that uh, we we thought in in this uh, and, and uh, blue giant stars and yes, uh, is 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 different that we imagine about the color of, of the star. It's not only the size or or the or uh, you know how old is course that uh, is, is really interesting well i'm continuing take pictures with much better uh, i think that maybe <laughs> much with better quality ah yes i i love the see you in patagonia argentina amigos <laughs> yeah oh, yeah see sí. pedro pedro is is really it's, it's lucky to live in Patagonia. It's, it's a great yes. place. Actually, I, the, I took that picture. And, really? Uh, ah, whoa. Yes, it's not, yeah. yeah. And the one, yeah. That is behind, the one that is behind me with the, the birds flying on the sea, I, will, I took that one too. That, that, wow. that picture behind me is in Camarones, uh, where the... Ah, uh, where we were. Yeah, where the eclipse happened, the 2017 eclipse happened. Yes, the annular eclipse, uh, Pedro. Yeah, we, we, we were together, yes, making the, 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 the solar uh, eclipse party. This was the, the first one. The second one was in San Juan, and the third was in, 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 the, windy, in the windy eclipse. The uh, windy eclipse, Chile. yes. <laughs> yes, yes, it's come now because it, I... I was like a, a weather report man in a hurricane mm. because we have a, a, the most wind eclipse that I, I ever seen. But in the Patagonia is normal. It's okay. It's, the people say it's a little windy and the things are shy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dust, yeah. <laughs> but but nice. A lot of dust. Well, thank you, you very ever, much, Cesar and Pietro. If you, if, you, if you ever come to Patagonia, I'd advise you not to bring an umbrella. It's useless. <laughs> no, That's never. good to know. <laughs> of course, if it does, I'll bring a hat in case it does the one out of 320-something days, uh, 360 days. If it's the <laughs> one day it does have precipitation, I'll at least mm -hmm. have a hat. Mm -hmm. But the rest, yeah. I'll, I'll be... I'll be uh, Sounds good. I would love to visit that beach at night, of course. Yeah. 
Oh, yes, uh, 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 you, Adrian, Sorry? that no. we lo you love. Yes, Adrian yeah. loved to take pictures of the Milky Way, and of course that that Milky Way in Patagonia is is amazing. Yeah, it's the, the, it's the other Cross side. I don't get to your see. Head. <laughs> yeah, it, your I head. get. It's <laughs> what I don't get to see. I, you see the one in my background. If I go this way. That's it. We get the Cygnus region and we go north. You go right. you go all the way down past the trees and even further. So it is something I am looking forward to um, sometime um, within the next uh, few years. I would like to image. Yeah, don't make it too long because it is. I mean, once you've seen it, you'll go, wow, why, why did I wait so long to, yeah, to see this? I, you know, it's kind of like that. Bring a, a, a sweater, and it's very cold here when the Milky Way is is uprising. So, yeah, okay, so it's opposite prepare. of our summer. Exactly. Well, that's, yeah. that's fine. Winter. And also, <laughs> there will be less people to interrupt my imaging. I I was I was looking at the at the Milky Way uh, last week. I was right above our head. I, I wanted to to show it to to to. To a family and uh, we, we, we and the telescope it, it was so high the southern cross I, I couldn't point the telescope to the, to the southern cross mm. um, oh. it, it, yeah. it was just yes, because I had to wait I had to wait uh, yeah uh, we we didn't because also it was extremely cold it was like uh, zero degrees Celsius so we, oh. we went inside uh, yeah and uh, we decided to wait for spring. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for <Yeah>. spring. <laughs> well, oh. yeah, so I have to go in the winter when it's most brilliant, and my camera would stay cold too. So yes. that's, uh, yes. I will it, have to keep it cooler in Patagonia, of course. Yeah, bring yeah. extra batteries, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah only... I've got some of those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. well, more, more I, reason I to, um, more reason to convert one of my, my uh, Canon camera um because it it would do a great job i've i've taken to using a converted camera to this is without a converted camera it was in a Bortle to sky anything less in a converted camera would get you all of the detail that you see here and um you know those i know I, we're keeping with our theme of stars just so many of them in the milky way yeah. even the northern part stretches um you know, all the way across the southern part of the sky. And it's it can be amazing just how many stars are you we're seeing in that in that one region. So yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Yep. Well well up next is Maxi Folares. And Maxi is also from Argentina. He's been on our program now. I think this is program number three or four. It's a, it's an Argentinian in, invasion in Bash. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we In where? Argentinian <laughs> invasion. Invasion. <laughs> invasion. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Invasion. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, we love it. So uh, Maxi uh, has uh, sh shaken up the amateur astrophotography world with his amazing images uh, uh, using, uh, you know, his modified uh, smart smartphone camera um, uh, and, and showing amateur astronomers how they can do really stunning work with very low cost equipment um you know and uh but uh using uh you know all the techniques that are available to amateur astro astrophotographers today uh maxi uh yeah I, I really just uh, blew our minds the first time we got to see these <laughs> images so <laughs> yeah. but um uh so I'm, I'm really glad that you're on the show again, Maxi. Um, uh, we, we, we like your uh, demeanor and um, uh, your, your willingness to share your secrets with uh, this audience. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay, Scott, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Um, yeah. So basically, uh, what I want to talk tonight is um, what I did last weekend, I 
didn't have to I couldn't have to work with my cell phone because uh, I have some issues with the battery and everything. So basically I use a little uh, planetary camera to do deep sky objects. Uh, I have a, a QHY5 monochrome. All oh, right. Some uh, LRGB filters. And I'm still practice on it uh, because um, I have so, a lot to, to still learning how to process, how to uh, get focus, but I could take, a, I can take a, almost a 40 minutes a pictures of 15 seconds. Maybe we'll gain 16 in RGB, but in luminance, I did almost uh, two hours <laughs> in 15 oh, wow. seconds. Okay. My, my hard drive uh, doesn't blow, but uh, that's a lot to process. Yes. Uh, so with patience, a uh, practice, and then over and over again, uh, let me show you my screen. Uh, what is it? Ah. Uh, no, wait. Ah, no. down here, sorry. Okay, you're seeing right now? Yes. Well, basically what I did, uh, well, this is uh, in a stretch uh, virtually, but you can see the pillars of creation. Mm -hmm. And when I stretch virtually, this is what looks. This, uh, when I see this in the box, like I was talking more early, uh, I, I couldn't believe that I can take this. You, you know, this little star and the the nebula, the gas, the dust, and everything, the 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 pillars and these clouds uh, floating somewhere, <laughs> right? <laughs> Constructing the 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 deep and the and everything, but. Basically, uh, let me show you where I, no, sorry. This is uh, here. Well, um, um, I, a, a few minutes ago, uh, Pedro was talking about to uh, the, the channels that was taking pictures in blue, red, and green. Uh, when you see in a luminance uh, photo, right? But this is in blue channel. You can see this, uh, the stars, something maybe algo. Uh, this is in green channel and this is in red channel. And this is what I get of M83. Wow. Yeah, oh, it's beautiful. Maxi. Very beautiful. You did, you did again, Maxi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is with with a planetary camera. Uh, a very. Yeah, I, I have one of those cameras, Maxi. Uh, <laughs> and I would. I'm very impressed <laughs> with what you're doing with this. I use that camera just as an auto guider, you know. Yes, I did. I I do the same, but I don't have another guide camera. So yeah, the, yeah. Well, look at that. You, apparently, you don't need. Uh, you don't need. The, Maxi doesn't need to buy a high end uh, uh, astro camera because he he makes. He makes an inexpensive camera really perform. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a huge thing to see because you, you know, it, it can get cost prohibitive to buy the yeah, expensive cameras. Right? Whereas if right technique, um, you can have your own very own beautiful uh, deep space objects. And um, exactly. And. You see, this important. is uh, the the FOV, the FOV, 
uh, yeah. of yeah. the camera yeah. and yeah. my eight inches telescope. Uh, so it's very zoom image. And when I see the, the structure, the, uh, the arms, the, the little nebulas, uh, whoa, <laughs> uh, maybe the, the process well it wasn't very good. The stars, the color of the stars, maybe it doesn't good, but it's a galaxy at 15 million light years million from us. <laughs> so, uh, then uh, I did the Eagle Nebula, but only in luminance because uh, the, the clouds come that night. This was the last uh, weekend. But uh, this weekend, this Saturday, we'll have a very good weather here. That's what Mitty Blue says. <laughs> and uh, with some friends, we are going to to a place where in the future, in a few months, it will be the new uh, observatory in the region of my city. Uh, it's an old uh, farm school that it doesn't uh, um, goes anymore like a, like a school, but it uh, the the government of that city uh, it will um, investment to rebuild the place and do it for do astronomy observations to uh -huh. uh, bring all of amateur astronomers and professional astronomer, astronomers to, to go to do astrophotography or studies, and also the schools of the region to do um, presentations, to go to... Uh, and you have the, the entire farm sky. Uh, that's why I here with the light pollution map, this is Chivilcoy, where I'm from. Yeah. This is the city of Alberti. And the okay. school, the, 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 the new observatory, it will be, uh, let me see, uh, this is the, right here. Ah, oh, it's in the dark area. Yeah, it, very dark. Exactly. So we have uh, maybe in the southeast, but at the west and also at the senate the sky was amazing you see the shadow of chivilcoy alberti bragado and chacabuco but uh, yeah it's dark it's dark the, it's very dark the, yeah. this is the the, the the city of alberti the, the government that publishes the the leasing of mm -hmm. the public leasing to rebuild this the structure to uh, you, you can see it's a, an old, very old uh, structure because yeah. this was built maybe in the 29th century, I think, when the city was founded. So, very good. And yeah. this was nice, promoted. Bro. This was promoted by Marco Santa Rosa, the, this guy here in the in the chat. Uh, that he's the director of uh, uh, from another school, and he's also a, a, a teacher. And in, we we talked with him almost one year ago. Mm -hmm. He told me that project, but with the pandemic situation and everything, he thought that maybe it won't be run. But uh, the government said. The government says uh, we will do it because the people need this. So yeah, this is this great. is amazing because that's, it is amazing. It's great. Uh, you, we are we have a situation of um, monetary and economy very bad here, mm -hmm. and also really? the pandemic. Argentina. <laughs> 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 well, that explains why you do. That explains why you do so much with. Uh, with uh, humble equipment, you, you, yeah. you have learned to make a way. You see, the the, the 
uh, the official money that requires is uh, 20, um, um, 29 million of pesos. In dollars, it will be six, uh, six, um, $160, thousands. Uh, $160,000. Yeah. $160,000, yes. $160, US. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so, so for that. But uh, maybe it's not a lot of money, but to do this, it's, it's a, a it's, it's still a, it's yes. it's a it's a great investment into science and science education, exactly in, in your community, and that that does build up uh, societies. I you know I'm very convinced of that. So um, I hope I, this this uh, will will continuing because we need this we have uh, another observatory in mercedes it's more like the in the east let me show you uh this is chivilco this is the road the the, the route five suipacha mercedes and the observatory is from here but mm. um with the pandemic situation is uh, for now it's not opening to people uh, uh, but we need this in here. Here in Chivigoy also we have um, a, what we call Parque del Cielo del Sur, the, the park of the southern skies. Okay. Uh, this was a project of my professor, my professor of physics, Armando Sandanel, uh, that he built a park with, with play to... to, to to make, uh, of course, uh, in culture of uh, astronomy, but uh, from ludic games for mm. the young people, uh, the young kids. Uh, let me show you without the light pollution because it doesn't matter here. Uh, well, a little bit because it is in the city and we have a soccer um, a field that, wait, don't, uh, I can see the the other way. Okay, so this is Chivilcoy. You can see it's every square. Uh, okay, so this is where I live from here. But the park you can see in the in, from Google Maps uh, here. Mm -hmm. This is the entrance. Uh, these are the ludic games, uh, rela uh, relationship with astronomy, and you can see the um, the place the, uh, from the the games. They are pointing to the uh, uh, geographical uh, coordinates, the north the south, the west, and the east, mm. but also the others. Here's a, a place where you can go to the rooftop to do some observations, but also inside of the building uh, is uh, where the, the Congress ha happens and people like uh, pro other professors and professional astronomers and educators go to uh, here and do some chats. Uh, this is a place, uh, a very good thing about it, but uh, to do some uh, observations, to bring people to, to see uh, the light pollution really killed us because yeah. Uh, this is where he's sitting right now. Um, oh, yeah. Well, it's very purple. <laughs> and let me, I don't find Well, that. certainly for deep sky work, it would, you know, uh, for planets, stars, it's, you know. Right in stars, in some constellations. Uh, yep. I, I remember before the pandemic in February, we have been doing some observation with uh, Armando and other uh, uh, helpers to, and you know, uh, people was going to see this. Uh, they have curious uh, sure. and 
And that was amazing because in this city, maybe sometimes, oh no, astronomy, ah no, the, the relationship with uh, astrology and, and yeah, don't, don't give some, uh, they, they don't realize how important is the astronomy. Uh, maybe I'm a fanatic, you know, but uh, to the education. Uh, yeah. it's, well, we, need, uh, we need fanatics for education, you know, so <laughs> and I think it's I think it's great. I, I think it's great what you're doing and, uh, uh, you know, establishments of, of a park like this uh, is still great, even in the even in the city, because sometimes, you know, it's wonderful to have a dark sky site of course for for uh, oh, serious amateur astronomy or professional astronomy but it's also um sometimes you have to bring astronomy to the public and that means you need to go to the city <laughs> to do it <laughs> and uh so i i i see a need for both and um you know i'm glad that uh your community at large is embracing this this is wonderful well thank you Okay, so uh, that's it. Uh, I hope this uh, Sunday, this Saturday, uh, maybe I, I think I will do in the pictures with the DSLR and the the the, uh, the GSO uh, telescope. Yeah, but uh, because I will have, uh, I have some dark skies a little bit, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, unfortunately, the weather here is very wet, so the the equipment maybe will be a little wet. <laughs> <laughs> well, sounds like my my home state, oh. uh, Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although we've had we've had more clear skies than we usually get yeah. in our town, so right. So okay. Okay, uh, thank right. you, Maxi. Thank you very much. Um, no, thank, thank you again. Uh, yeah. Up next is Adrian Bradley. Adrian has uh, been showing us amazing uh, night sky photography as landscapes with uh, uh, the Milky Way. Um, uh, his, um, you know, his interpretation of the night sky as revealed in his beautiful work. Uh, is very moving. Um, Adrian's one of uh, David Levy's favorite uh, photographers, and uh, he's quickly becoming one of ours too. And uh, so, um, Adrian, I, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, thanks, thanks for um, uh, coming on yet again. So, Great. Yeah. So uh, thank you for having me. Um, despite the fact that I'll be attempting to um, head to a spot to capture the uh eclipse we're i'm in michigan and we're in um a location that will at least get to see partiality um mm -hmm. if that's a word and i'm going to try traveling uh within two and a half hours or so to um to a spot that's off of our um, lake michigan and attempt to watch the sun come up it should come up as a crescent and um, I have a solar filter, but also I plan on shooting at the sun directly as it's coming up. And hopefully I'll have um, a good image. Just to let you know, you're, uh, Scott, your um, Explore Scientific mate, uh, Jason Gunzel, is also yeah. going to have a beautiful picture. We have a, a bridge span, the Mackinac Bridge. Oh, okay. And uh, he's going to try and capture it capture it coming over that so uh, that's very so cool. there should be some pretty good pictures um yeah. coming from us i'll be um uploading those to um the eclipse watch that is being done and i think we posted um i think we posted the urls that people can go and see the um see those so right i am going to just take a couple of minutes um i'm going to share my sound i'm going to optimize the video clip because i have a video clip repost of those 17 Please. and it's not um so before i just want this is a screen this is using a camera 
a tracker and a uh, 100, 100 to 400 millimeter lens. I believe I had it at 100 millimeters at a dark sky and a fairly short exposure around two minutes or so. And I ended up with this image of the uh, sword of Orion. So mm -hmm. really depending on the skies that you're in and the how uh, sharp your tracking is, you can gather not only some pretty good images in a short amount of time, um, but you also see how many satellites are being launched. You see geosynchronous satellites and then groups of satellites. So that unfortunately, um, as your as your imaging stars, you can, and this is without a modified camera. So, mm -hmm. as your imaging stars, <clears throat> just get started with what you've got, um, and of the long enough exposure, and you can, you know, you can get starlight, and it only just goes uphill from there. As you get, you get just enough equipment to get the types of images that you're looking for. So I will show two minutes of this video. I got a chance to see the total solar eclipse um, in 2017. This is using a five inch telescope, an iPhone to record. And I started the video at the realizing after looking at totality start, and this is upside down because it's a Newtonian. Um, I looked at totality start and then I looked on my phone and realized that I hadn't lost it after all. It was, it was enough of it in the picture that I was able to track it. So what I'm showing is kind of what totality looks like. And as, as you're looking at it and how loud and crazy it gets when totality is going. So I'll play this video and then just let me know if you're able to hear it. Okay. And it's on the, I got it on the uh, thing. Are you able to hear? Yes. yes. Yeah, we hear it? Yes. Okay, good. I got to get my camera. Wow. Gotta get my camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's late. <laughs> Pull the solar filter off of... Hey, fireworks! Just listen at the comments. Oh, my God. Look at the, the comments that we had. Hey. <laughs> that people are there's a lot of screaming that goes on holy i'm gonna take a picture from here look at that is it i have i have it on the phone is it bad that i told the cheater to just <laughs> i actually have it on the phone recording <laughs> oh. i love to listen to wow <laughs> yeah oh yeah it always happens I got it. No, you, you can kind of see the. This was about two minutes. Go ahead, you were here first. Oh. Just take a look at. Just take a look at the corner. Yeah. Right. Just take a quick peek of that. I don't have it full on, but just take a look at that. I don't want to hog that because time is. Okay. I'm just Mars. not steady enough. Jupiter. Start yeah. pointing out <laughs> some of the planets that you can see in the darkness. Yeah. yeah. That was either Mercury or Mars. I'm not sure which. Yeah, it's either Mercury or Mars. You notice sure it's starting to change as it's getting near to the end of totality. Wow. At some point, I look through my telescope and you'll... All right, Garrett and Richard. Get a photo in this one right now. I just looked through the you telescope and saw what it looked like through an 11 inch telescope. If you look at it, you can see what? You can see the prominence is coming off of the sun. Let's let people observe. Forget the picture. Wow. Let people observe. Forget the picture. Just, just take a look. Just take a look? Quick oh, look. This is about the moment yeah. totality is. There's the diamond oh, ring. The diamond oh, ring. Yeah. The diamond ring. <laughs> All right. And I covered the uh, and I covered the uh, telescope, so I wouldn't yes. burn my optics. Yeah, I, I, I listen. Put the glasses. Put the glasses. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's um. 
That no, was. You, you remind me the last eclipse. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Adrian, no, no. because you, yes, you remind me the, the, the emotion. Yes. With yeah, Pedro, he... I, I, I think that I have, uh, I took in, in the San Juan eclipse, eh? we was with, with Pedro, and mm. I remember that I took the moment to, to, to take a video only with the cell phone, and me saying uh, uh, explicit things because <laughs> the emotion it happens. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe this. Beep, uh, you know. Listen, yeah, and it's I um, what? So one, we were at we were at a church, so we managed to keep it kid friendly. <laughs> there were so many kids around, <laughs> but um, part of the reason I decided to. Um, share the video um, at a um, at an astronomy meeting recently. <clears throat> we had someone share a video from 1979, and oh, wow. that wow. is when they they went on this long journey. In fact, they could go into Canada, um, and they saw a total solar eclipse pass through, and all you heard were all the explicit words from yeah. the sheer <laughs> just seeing it. <laughs> You know, it was, <laughs> but you, you understand when, you, and I may have talked over it, somebody yelling, oh my God, um, <laughs> you heard the kids in their excitement as they were, scr someone scrambling to get a camera <coughs> to see it. The, the thing, the toughest thing to do was to convince people, there were a lot of people looking at that image on my, on my phone as the eclipse was happening. And I tried to convince to tell people look at it through um just look at it with your eyes you know you yeah. can look, you can yes. look at totality the way it shows up on that screen once it's total you're not in danger of burning your eyes out the corona is it's a beautiful thing to notice it does look something like that to your eyes but then you take a picture you can get more yeah. detail on how the corona yes. looks and what's also amazing is how one how different it looks um with each uh, total solar eclipse. With the annular eclipse, of course, it is gonna look more like a ring of fire. Um, hopefully Kareem from uh, Rask and a few of those members get some great pictures of it uh, when it, you know, when it goes annular. And I'll have some images partially if all goes well. But um, with a to the, t the total solar eclipse, for those that are out there listening still and, um, we recommend you try and see at least one in your lifetime. Um, and uh, you will want to see yeah, it. If you can only do once in your lifetime. Once you do one, it's like eating those potato chips. So you can't just eat yeah. one, you know, you're, so. you're going to find a way right? to go. Now we're fortunate <laughs> that um, I traveled to Tennessee for that eclipse. We're fortunate okay. that we're going to have an eclipse an hour away. Um, the center line goes through, uh, basically through Toledo, Ohio, which is mm. from where I live. That's about an hour drive. However, it's going to be April and the weather in Michigan may not be, or Ohio may not be ideal. So a lot of people are going to Texas. I'm going to Texas. You're going to go to Texas, Scott. Yeah. And that, you know, so that it's, you're going to, it's going to be a better chance of better weather to actually see the eclipse. So I'm still debating if I'm going to make that trip or not. Um, but, um, having seen it once and this would be, this would be the best chance for my family to see it. Cause they didn't, my son and daughter came with me and I'm glad I took them, uh, the rest of my family, this would be their chance to actually see it. And, um, you know, those that can make the trip, um, the plan is to go to the center line. I won't necessarily be in, um, Toledo's. I think the center line is a little further South. Um, couple of anecdotes. My cousins were in Nashville. I was there in White House, Tennessee. I saw the entire uh, totality. They missed a cloud bank came over Nashville oh. and covered totality. Oh. My cousins didn't get to see it. Oh. Um, the other thing was someone <clears throat> walking up to me and saying they felt the pollen rush when the when totality ended and asked if they were crazy. And I said, no. The plants, the plant life and animal life did stop. 
um, once totality happened. It's one of the things you pay attention to. Mm -hmm. I was trying to call out planets and I, because I didn't have my phone, I couldn't look <laughs> it up to say what really was that planet. But um, I, um, I tried to call things out. You, you try to observe not only the eclipse, but everything going on around it. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, you, yes. you, you don't, you know, if you're just fixated on the eclipse, that's, that's fine. But um, it's the entire, what happens, you know, the entire experience and, you know, try as you might, it's hard not to yell and scream when you see it. Cause it's just something you don't see. You don't see every year. No, um, no. It's, no, yeah. it's pretty amazing I, to look I have, at. I have here the, the video that I record with the cell phone bed, uh, with a little tripod above my car and pointing the eclipse. Uh, I put it to record and still taking pictures with the camera. And I was hearing the, the, the say, or that maybe not the insults, but uh, the, the effort, the, the, the screaming of that, that way you are leaving, you know? Uh, what happened? So oh, cool. We went to uh, we went cool. into a new view. <laughs> it's called immersive view. Oh wow! Yeah. So we're like yeah. in a room. We're we're framed here. So yeah, yeah. wow. That's I, nice. I feel like a, like a piece of art. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I should you move are. my head. I should move my head so my image just shows up. Now, yeah, right there. Then yeah. it'll look like uh, that's what my <laughs> picture would look like in a frame. Well, without yeah. me in it. <laughs> Let me. I, I don't think it's broadcasting. So here yeah. we go. We're going back. <laughs> okay. Too bad they couldn't see that. You see the, the screen? Yes. Yeah. Uh, pre prepare to hear. Uh, okay. It, this is a li little bit um, awkward because I was screaming like uh, no, a crazy that's, man. <laughs> that's the first <laughs> time I. That's Maxi, the first you. time. I've Maxi, released that video were. to anything public because I was rather embarrassed <laughs> with how I was running around and yelling. Um, you, you've got to look at it right now. It's like I didn't want people to know I uh, did that. You, but here, this pot, this dot, it's Venus, and when the clouds go by, the the, the eclipse, the, it doesn't see very good because uh, the the shining and the the cell phone was. I, I didn't realize uh, it was in automatic mode and decreased the the the, yeah. the, yeah. the overexposed the brightness. exactly overexposed and, it, yes. but you can see the, the, the darkness the the clouds the the, the uh. yeah you had <laughs> no, a cloudy eclipse Maxi you were where yeah. I was in the in the same area yes about uh, six hundred meters. Maybe no, maybe yes, one kilometer. Maybe ah, somewhere. okay, okay. You, you you were in another place, but in Balcheta too. Yeah. You you are here in the. Yeah, that was totality, right? Yes. Yes. It was totality. Yeah, you can see the, the really a little dark. Yeah. No, I started to cry. No. I'm transmit this for for Scott in, in direct. Mm, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. The, the clouds, they are the very gray, and here is, no, no, this, this was. Yeah, but you still got something. Oh, yes. there's the. There were a lot of teams that were trying to get this eclipse uh, down in Argentina and uh, also in Chile. And, you know, uh, most people were clouded out and uh, Caesar was able to get it. So, you know, we, I was very grateful for that. And we got to experience this eclipse. Um you know, from such a great distance. It, it was awesome. Do you hear the wind? Actually, I'm not hearing. I don't know if you've got your sound uh, enabled. I, uh, maybe you your share, sound is. Yeah, you would have to hear. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, when you share your screen, Maxi, there's something that says uh, enable sound. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes, yes. See that? Yeah. 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 Click yes. that. That helps. Okay, here's going. There we go. <laughs> now you can hear the wind. It sounds like a jet plane. Uh, here's Venus. Here's okay. Mercury. 
That's Mercury. Wow. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And here's oh, more, obviously oh. the, the cliff. Now that's and when the class goes by, the the eclipse was end. Uh, oh. <laughs> you, you know that happens here in the 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 past year. Yeah. Uh, the two of July because I had you know you remember the animation that I did the clouds and then the the cliffs is, uh, goes down uh, yeah. from the horizon. Yeah. And yeah, you had a sunset totality. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you had sunrise and sunset totalities, or any types of eclipses. I I can't I believe there. Yeah, look at the look no, at the brightness goes, go. Yeah. yeah. Um, those they're you're you can photograph them, I think, with a very narrow aperture without having to put a filter on. I'm going to bring one just in case, just so that if I if I don't succeed at quite getting a good, you know, one shot natural photo with the partiality in it, I'll at least put the filter on, take a picture, and maybe consider doing a composite shot. So they're yeah. There will be something. I, I will figure something out. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> like, like a like a soccer screening. play. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, that, that that was me. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, Maxie, well, you drive safely, Scott. Adrian. Okay. Uh, yes. and a half yeah. hours at this a, time of night is. Uh, yeah. yes. Yeah, we take a nice look for deer, yeah. you know, nice all that stuff. So, yeah, Thank maybe you. next next uh, global star party we will share what I got. Yes, yeah, sure. Yes. 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 Yep. yes. Hopefully, hopefully I will have some I will have something to share even if sure. I have to wait and then no. point at the sky. I'll have <laughs> I'll have one eclipse image at least. That is my Yeah. Is Adrian, my goal. The all important right. the importance of all of this is Enjoy, enjoy it and enjoy oh, it with yeah. your family and your i uh, will that's everybody. right absolutely okay yeah. right. you right. maybe have a perfect picture and maybe you have a, a, a single imperfect. picture <laughs> yeah but the remember and the feeling it doesn't compare that's <laughs> true mm. all right everybody thanks again thank Scott, you for hey, thank, really thank you it. thank you guys I, for trying to uh, uh, make the next one helping us wrap up the 49th global star party next tuesday i think it's the 15th of june uh is uh the 50th global star party we'll have a special door prize uh, uh that uh, will be real exciting and uh, uh you know of course we'll have all of our guys bringing uh you know the best in astronomy to you so uh from all over the world Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank Thanks, Maxi, Caesar, Adrian, Thank you. and all the rest Thank of you, you guys that are watching you, in the audience and the other participants that might still be watching from somewhere. Uh, have a good night. Keep looking up, and uh, we'll be back. Take care. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.